<laughs> Sorry, that took a while. All right. Hello. Hello, team. Hello. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to do a couple things first. We have a rule, a, a rule here where if we have more than 16 speakers on um, an item, everyone will get two minutes instead of three. So before we start anything, I'd like to sh get a show of hands of, of both online and in person. Who's here to speak about the public hearing item, the concept review? Please just raise your hand. Okay. And also online, you guys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Is there anyone online? Got about nine raised hands. On. Okay, so everyone will have two minutes. When we get there, plan accordingly. All right, um, but right now we're going to talk about, we're gonna have public participation, which are folks who wanna talk about anything except the public hearing item. If anyone wants to speak, uh, has anyone signed up? Well, we still have some hands up, I think from the previous ask, okay. um, so. I would ask that people maybe raise their hands if only if right now, only if you wish to speak for this open comment part of the meeting. Just give it a couple seconds. All right. Excellent. Nobody for public participation. For there are actually a couple of hands. Yeah. Oh, there are. Never yeah. mind. There's a few online. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. We'll start with uh, George Kraft, followed by Lynn Siegel. George, you have three minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, I finally got the unmute. This is just general comments. I had a comment about the uh, Williams Village uh, development specifically. All right, George. Uh, George, um, we're going to be speaking about that during the public hearing uh, per uh, comment period. So if you don't mind holding off on your comments. I certainly will. Thank you. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you, George. Look forward to hearing from you later. Um, okay, Lynn Siegel, please go ahead. You have three minutes. Top of the agenda is Gaza. That's your most important thing that you as a planning board can be thinking about. Because if we have continued involvement in that situation, we are going to be depleted of funds in reparations until doomsday. If unless we get bombed first by Iran in protest. So the best thing that you can do as a planning board is recommend a city council to get out of Gaza in the occupation and um, and yesterday, 75 years ago, actually, and um, be on the right side of history and do it and do it soon because you haven't got anything to plan for otherwise. Nothing. A big fat nothing. Not, not the um, Williams Village thing. Nothing. Now, as far as weather vane, this is the most obscene example of a development that I've ever come before, and I watched this come about when it was Waterview first, and it's just appalling that we're getting more and more of this, and it's just like a little dense micro city. It's Jared Polis's wet dream. And we don't need that in Boulder. Um, we've got enough densification all over the place without making it. it that isn't that, it actually, you know, it's not, it's not densification. There was nothing there. There's still nothing there. It's anchored on a brew pub, remember? So what do we need with things like that? And a garage in every unit. And, you know, just add a couple lanes to Arapaho, no problem. No, the, all of these developments and all the wealth inequity, the wealth inequity just causes more homelessness and we haven't got the money for it. Six million bucks to clean up the trash and everything else. And you can watch. City council's going to entertain it for six, for three hours, and that isn't going to be enough. They could take three years, and they can never solve it. Mike Johnston can't solve it. New York can't solve it. San Francisco can't solve it. But you know what? The way you solve it is you tell developers no, and you tell them no at the planning board. You tell them no height, height increases. You tell them no parking relaxations. 
That's what you do. You say, you learn how to say no. You go to school to learn no, no, no. That's the only way. And every then you have to tell everybody else to do it too because the homeless will go from one town to the next and they'll propagate to Boulder and we'll just be doing nothing but paying $100,000 for each one. Thank you, Lynn. Thank, Thank you, Lynn. Lynn. Please wrap it up. Per year. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the open comment section. Over Thank you. Apparently we have a comment, a question about timing. Uh, we've got a number of call-up items to go through. Um, my guess is we'll get through the pretty quickly. So whoever asked the question, I believe we'll probably start on the public hearing item by about 6.30. Uh, but we won't get to public comment about that until probably 7.15 or 7.30. So just be aware. All right, approval of minutes. Um, does someone want to make a motion on the minutes for November 21st? So moved. I move that we approve the minutes uh, from November 21st. Second. Okay. Um, I was not there, so uh, Mark? Yes. Yes. Kurt? Yes. Uh, ML? Yes. And George? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Lisa? Is Lisa there? Did I don't see her. Okay, I thought you had let her in. Uh, okay, uh, planning board minutes from December 5th. Uh, anyone want to make a motion? I move that we approve the minutes from December 5th. Second. Great. Mark? Yes. Laura? Yes. Uh, Kurt? Yes. ML? Yes. And George? Yes. All right, passes. Uh, planning board minutes from December 19th. Anyone want to? I move that we <laughs> approve the minutes from December 19th. Oh, I'll second. second. Oops. Uh, let's give it Sorry, to Sorry, Kurt. No, no, <laughs> give it to ML. Mark? Yes. Laura? Yes. Yes. ML? Yes. George? I was absent. Okay, Sarah is a yes, and so it passes. Okay, now we have discussion of dispositions and call-ups and continuations. Call up item final plat to subdivide the property at 1937 Upland Avenue to create three lots. Lot one is uh, 19, 1, 19, 19,575 square feet. Lot two is 9,724 square feet. And lot three is 7,881 square feet. Adam subdivision case number tech 2022 0006. The preliminary plat was approved through case number LUR 2022-00003. This application is subject to potential call-up on or before January 16th, 2024. Does anyone have questions for staff or does anyone want to call it up? Okay. Next call-up item, 2105 Mapleton Avenue, non-conforming use review, LUR 2023-00047. Non-conforming use review for a 201 square foot addition to the attached dwelling unit at 2105 Mapleton Avenue, including updated landscaping and architectural improvements. The call-up period expires on January 16th, 2024. Questions for staff? Then we want to call it up. Oh wait, Lord, uh, ML, you have your hand up. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yes, I just have a question for staff on this. Uh, I'm curious about. Um, so the requested or the required off-street parking for 2103 Mapleton is not on the 2103 Mapleton property. Am I reading that correct, but it's on the adjacent property? No, that is incorrect. And apologies if that was not uh, conveyed correctly, but uh, they are on the same property. These This duplex has been condoed out. So there's only one property here. Oh, so the property line has more to do with it being the duplex condos correct. condos correct. It, it's on not one piece of official, land got it correct yes it's not okay an official property line thank you i was thinking how did that happen <laughs> i'd like to know that <laughs> little workaround um thank you adam i i don't intend to call it up okay all right we'll move on to call item call up item c stream wetland and water body map revision WET 2023-00019, Gebhardt ISP mapping revision. The call-up period expires on January 16th, 2024. Questions, comments, call-ups? Nope. Okay. 
call up item D, standard wetland permit WET 2023-00014, driveway culvert replacement at 8550 and 8600 Valmont. The call up period expires on January 16th, 2024. Questions, comments, call ups? I told you, I, I told you, Edward, I'd get you out of here. Um, call up item E, standard wetland permit WET 2023-00020, Chapman Drive Trailhead and Pedestrian Bridge. The call up period expires on Jan oh, shoot, January 6th, 16th, 2024. Yes, go ahead, please. I'm, I'm ruining Edward's <laughs> night. Uh, so I, yeah, I have a few questions about this. There's, as I understand it, there's two main portions to this project. One is the bridge, which is the extension of the Boulder Creek path. And then the other one is the significant changes to the parking area and the reconfiguration and the, the walkways up and so on. Is that, that's correct? That is correct. Okay, so in terms of the turnaround and the trailer parking, that the motivation for that is to provide for horse trailers and hand cycles. Is that is my let me double check correct? <laughs> in it. Primarily just indicates improvement to the access there. I don't see a specific type of user that it's been designed for according to their application. Okay, well, the, the description talks primarily about horse trailers and this trailer parking area there. Um, so, and, and maybe this is more of a question for, for OSMP. Um, I don't know if anybody is available for that, but really my question comes down to, this is a significant amount of work with a significant amount of, I think, earth moving and regrading and disturbance of existing land, even though a lot of it is on the, the former house site there. So it's, it's kind of disturbed. It was disturbed at one time, but I think it's largely regrowing. And I just, I have questions how much demand there actually is for horse trailer parking there or hand cycle parking there. So in the context of wetlands, we have in 993E, there's this criterion about minimization that says, the applicant should, shall demonstrate that the activity is designed and located to minimize direct or indirect impacts to the adjacent wetland stream or water body. And we, I think we're going to be getting training in what this means, uh, but my interpretation of that is minimize sort of balancing the values, uh, the, the, the benefits that might be coming from this. And if the benefits are minimal, then I have questions about the, the, the wetland impacts that are resulting from that. So I don't know if you have Certainly, any I mean, The way we look at it typically is if you look in their wetland report, section 8.0 talks about their alternative analysis. And so we look right. to see, you know, was that a robust, robust analysis looking at options that would help mitigate the impacts? And then of course, also within that, looking at first mitigating direct impacts to the wetland or water body versus the inner and outer buffers, which in this case, primary impacts are to the buffers and there are no permanent impacts to the wetland itself. Right. So in the, um, in the um, alternatives, I guess it was, um, it talked about the no build option, which as it should, and the no build option says, well, if we didn't build, then we wouldn't get this trailer parking. But that is not really, just having the trailer parking is not beneficial if it's not actually used. So I guess I would like to call this up. All right, there you go. It's been called up. So um, I have additional questions and since it's been called up, it might be good to pose my questions so that you can uh, 
further when 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 we when you do come back before us you can be prepared with i have a completely different take on this but i was about to call it up as well so um send them by email or you can send them by email okay <laughs> not not to not to keep you from talking but it, you can that's also fine send them by email. that's fine okay okay and uh, you should probably send your comments by email as well just to reiterate them excellent all right uh we will move on to the final call thank you edward um, final call-up item, uh, Standard Wetland Permit WET 2023-00021, Saw Hill, Saw Hill Ponds Improvements. The call-up period expires on January 26, 2024. Any questions, comments? Guys on the online? No? All right. We're not calling that up. Edward, go home. Thank you. Have a nice Thank evening. You. Okay. We are now getting to the public hearing uh, section of our meeting. The public hearing item tonight, agenda title, concept review proposal to redevelop the 448,668 square foot site at 2952 Baseline Road with a mixed use development consisting of residential, commercial, hotel, and res restaurant uses. The existing buildings on site would be demolished and replaced with six new four to five story buildings containing retail, restaurant, and hotel uses, as well as approximately 610 new dwelling units, and a mix of structured and underground parking. The unit type mix would include market rate units and student housing units reviewed under case number LUR 2023-00038. Um, before Chandler, the staff person starts, um, I do wanna just go through if anyone has a conflict of interest. Uh, no, I can see ML, I can't see George. George, if you have a conflict of interest, just say yes or no. Nope. Nope. Okay. Excellent. Uh, all right. So Chandler, who is home with a cold and some sick children, please take it away. All right. Thank you. Um, just to check, you guys are seeing the presentation view. You're not seeing my notes. Well, so far, we're seeing the presentation. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, good evening, planning board members. I'm Chandler Van Scott, principal planner in planning and development services. And this presentation is for the uh, concept plan review at 2952 Baseline Road. Um, so presentation highlights very briefly. I'll go over the concept plan and purpose, uh, public notification procedures, the planning context, project background, summary of the proposed project, and um, we'll finish with key issues. Um, so the concept plan review process and the purpose um, is to allow planning board to review the general development plan, including uh, land uses, arrangement of those uses, general circulation patterns, uh, methods of encouraging alternative transportation, architectural characteristics, environmental preservation, Etc. And it is intended to give the applicant comments from the public, city staff, and planning board early in the process um, prior to submittal of a formal site review application. No formal action, um, which is approval or denial, is required on this application. So in terms of public notification, a uh, written notice was sent to property owners within 600 feet of the subject site. Notice was posted on the property as well. Um, staff initially received comments and questions from several neighbor, neighboring property owners and residents expressing concerns. Um, those, the primary concerns of those opposed include um, traffic and safety issues, um, loss of existing commercial space, uh, particularly the dark horse, um, and the overall scale and density of the project. And um, the majority of written comments, which um, largely were sent directly to planning board in the last um, 72 hours express support for the proposal. Um, so the approximately 9.59 acre project site encompasses the triangular area located east of Highway 36, south of Baseline Road and west of 30th Street, and excludes the Baseline Crossing site on the northwest corner of the site and the McDonald's site. The BBCP or Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan land use designation is split between mixed use business or MUB and community business or CB defined in chapter three of the 2010 Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan as follows. Um, so I'll just kind of paraphrase the community business designation 
um, are focal points for commercial activity serving a subcommunity or collection of neighborhoods um, intended to serve daily convenience shopping and personal service needs of nearby residents and support walkable communities. Uh, mixed use business development may be appropriate and will be encouraged in some business areas. Um, generally, the use applies to areas around 29th Street as well as North Boulder Village Center. Um, the commercial areas near Williams Village and other parcels around Pearl Street, 28th and 30th Street. Um, and this consists generally of business or residential uses. Housing and public uses supporting housing will be encouraged and may be required. Um, this map shows the overall um, split between the two land use designations. So as you can see, the majority of the site, uh, the eastern portion of the site is designated MUB. Um, the BBCP land use designation for the eastern portion of the site was changed from CB to MUB during the 2000 Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan update, but the site has never been rezoned to reflect the MUB designation. Um, so zoning districts intended to implement the MUB designation typically include BMS and the MU zone, so MU 1, 2, 3, or 4. Um, further, the Williams Village Center is identified in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan as a neighborhood center. And I'll get more into that later in the presentation. So in terms of zoning, um, the site is currently zoned Business Community 2 or BC2. It's adjacent to BU1 zoning to the north across baseline, public zoning to the east across 30th, which is where Williams Village is located. Um, to the west across Highway 36 lies the 2700 baseline site, which is also zoned BC2. Um, as well as Base Mart um, and the Martin Acres neighborhood, which is zoned RL1. Uh, the BC2 zoning district is defined as business areas containing retail centers serving a number of neighborhoods where retail type stores predom uh, predominate. Um, the project site is also located in a business community area subject to special use restrictions for Appendix N of the land use code, and I will get into that as well a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so this slide just shows um, an aerial map showing some of the surrounding um, context. To the east across 30th Street uh, is the University of Colorado Williams Village Dormitory Complex, which contains the 12-story 12 12 story Darley and Stearns buildings and the six-story Bear Creek apartment buildings. Uh, across Baseline Road to the north are a variety of retail service and office uses, including a gas station, a beauty salon, mortuary, and a medical office building. To the northeast of the intersection of Baseline and 30th Street lies the Baseline Subdivision, which is a single family neighborhood that has existed since the early 1960s. Um, US 36 runs along the eastern boundary of the site, across which lies the Martin Acres neighborhood. Aside from the CU buildings, all the existing buildings surrounding the site are generally one to three stories in height. Um, so this aerial image shows the existing site. Um, the site currently contains five existing uh, one to three story buildings containing a variety of retail and restaurant businesses, including Sprouts, the Dark Horse Saloon, uh, Cosmos Pizza, liquor store, a bank, and several other restaurants. Um, not including the hotel, there is about 65,000 square feet of commercial space currently on the site. There's a Conoco gas station on the northeast corner of the site off Baseline Road. And on the south corner of the site is the Boulder Broker Inn, uh, legal non-conforming hotel use. Both the Dark Horse and the Broker Inn have been in this location since 1974. Um, however, the property is not individually landmarked or located in a historic district, although it is eligible as noted in the staff memo. Um, in terms of the existing site access, um, not including the baseline crossing or McDonald's sites, there are currently nine existing access points to the site. There are four curb cuts on Baseline Road, five curb cuts along 30th Street, of the four existing access points on Baseline Road, only one, which is located between Baseline Crossing and McDonald's, shown there in green on the top of the screen, has full movement turn access, with the remainder being right in, right out only. Um, similarly, the existing access points on 30th Street are also right in, right out only, with the exception of the access serving Cosmos Pizza Building, uh, with only a single drive aisle providing access to westbound lanes on Baseline. The current access configuration severely limits opportunities for westbound travel from the site with U-turns on either 30th Street or at the signaled intersection of 30th and Baseline being required for the majority of exit points from the site. Um, so the site, much of the site is affected by the regulatory floodplain, um, including the 100-year uh, floodplain, the conveyance zone, and small portions of high hazard zone. Um, 
I can get, I can respond to, uh, Kurt asked a question earlier about um, floodplain, which I can respond to later. Um, so now jumping to the proposed project, um, as noted in the title, uh, the proposal is for a mixed use development consisting of 610 attached residential units. Um, of those, 285 would be student housing and 325 would be non-student units. Um, that comprises roughly 82% of the overall area. Um, they are proposing roughly 69,382 square feet of ground floor commercial, which is about 8% of the floor area, a 76,530 square foot hotel use, or 6%, and about 7,796 square feet of uh, restaurant use. So um, as shown here, the there are six four to five story buildings proposed ranging from 43,000 square feet to 267,000 square feet in size for a net FAR of about 1.9. Um, a new L-shaped right-of-way or street to break down the existing super block and a mix of at-grade parks, plazas, landscape setbacks, and rooftop decks. Um, it is worth noting that as part of the Zoning for Affordable Housing Code changes, which were adopted by council in October 2023 and went into effect on January 1st of this year, um, intensity standards in the BC2 zone district were revised um, so that the 1,600 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit requirement was replaced with a 1.5 FAR and a 15% open space per lot requirement. Um, up to a 2.0 FAR is permitted in designated neighborhood centers, of which this is one. Um, therefore, the proposed FAR is consistent with uh, existing BC2 intensity standards. Um, the proposed project includes redevelopment of the site with a mix of attached residential, commercial, and hotel uses, totaling approximately 725,989 square feet in floor area. Um, under the current proposal, um, and this is shown here on the um, land use map diagram, buildings A and B are proposed as a mix of ground floor commercial with residential units above. Buildings C and F are proposed as entirely residential, uh, non-student, and building D is proposed as a hotel use with an attached ground floor restaurant and commercial uses above. And building E is proposed to be entirely student housing. Um, so these are just some artistic renderings provided with the application um, showing um, just sort of the, the basic architectural idea and some of the landscaping. And these are reference images um, also provided with the application. Um, the application includes several reference images to illustrate the proposed project's architectural intent, but does not provide uh, specific information on materials. And um, staff's comments under concept review criteria in the memo um, provide some site review considerations that we have uh, notified the applicant of. Um, so a summary of required modifications as we understand them at this time. Um, the proposed modifications to the land use code would include a parking reduction um, as yet of undetermined size, a height modification to allow for 55 foot buildings where 35 feet is the maximum by right height, a modification to the maximum number of stories to allow for four and five story buildings where three is the maximum number of stories, um, and modification to access standards to allow for more than one access point per property. Um, for the height modification request, community benefit regulations would apply. Um, so bonus floor area is used to determine the required number of bonus units above the 25% inclusionary housing requirement, and that's based on the amount of floor area that exists above um, the third story. So all the floor area in the fourth and fifth stories. Um, and this results in additional required permanently affordable units or uh, cash in lieu, as the case may be. So key issues for discussion, and these are also outlined in the staff memo. Um, key issue, I will just jump to the slides to save time. So key issue one is the proposed concept plan generally compatible with the goals, objectives, and recommendations of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Um, these are some considerations for that discussion that we can come back to once the discussion begins. Again, it is a neighborhood center is listed in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Um, worth noting is that BC2 conditional use standards require use review if ground floor residential area exceeds 10% of the total floor area. 
Um, this is the primary criterion used in that use review process, which we can also come back to and discuss. Key issue number two, does planning board have feedback for the applicant on the conceptual site plan and building design? Um, here are some key takeaways from the discussion, which we will um, be able to use and which are also um, listed in the staff memorandum. Key issue number three, is the proposed building height of 55 feet in general proportion to the height of existing buildings in the area and the proposed or projected heights of buildings in the area? And um, key issue number four will be um, any other uh, key issues or topics of discussion that the planning board decides to come up with. And this is a building height context map showing um, height of existing buildings in the surrounding area. Um, then I have a ton of pictures from um, within the site uh, illustrating the surrounding context, but I figured we would probably get to those during discussion. So that is all for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chandler. Before we get to questions for Chandler, clarifying questions. If you came in after the meeting started and you intend to speak on this topic, sign up over here. You'll have two, everyone will have two minutes. All right, who has questions for Chandler? Go ahead, Chris. I can start um, if I get to them. Chandler, <laughs> um, I had several questions that I sent you. Um, the, oh, thank you. Um, the first one is about the inner, the really the access points, but particularly the the access points onto baseline and whether any of those under the city standards and policies could be signalized. Yes, and we were able to get um, some feedback from Edward on that answer, and the answer is yes, it's a possibility. Um, there's a lot to take into consideration and it would be based on um, largely on the final project plans that came in during site review as well as the traffic study that they provided at that time. Um, there's also spacing considerations, um, traffic queuing, et cetera, but um, it is possible to provide potentially one signalized intersection between um, US 36 and 30th Street. Okay, sounds good. My next question is also about transportation really. And it's about the fact that in the, the proposal, some of the streets, or at least one of the streets, depending on how you classify it, is public. And then there are a couple of other sections that are private. And I'm trying to understand how, from the city's perspective, how do you view the whether, whether streets should be private or public? What are the trade-offs? What are staff's preferences, I guess? Yeah. Um, in general, the city prefers public streets. Um, there are uh, standards in the land use code for when we do require dedication of right of way. Um, we also have to consider the subdivision standards. So right now we don't really know um, the extent to which they're planning to subdivide the site, but oftentimes right of way is required to provide the necessary frontage for subdivided lots. Um, there's also maintenance requirements. Um, so the city has standards for right of way and um, for emergency access and things like that. Um, so typically um, requiring uh, right of way dedication allows us to ensure that maintenance and access and all those things meet our standards. Um, so we, we didn't really get into an in-depth review um, of all the individual streets shown on, on this concept plan and kind of discussing whether or not they would be public or private. But um, in general, I think that it's um, it's safe to say that we prefer um, right of way to be dedicated and to be public and that that will likely be the case on this site. Okay, great. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. I got yeah, let me just I keep going. No, keep going. Just um, can um, Chandler, will you take down the building height context map so I can see the other two board members um, if they have uh, questions? Thank absolutely. You. Go ahead, please. Okay. The next question is about the extents of the Williams Village Center. In the Boulder Valley Comp Plan, when it talks about the neighborhood centers, it just has dots. And is there anything to clarify what the actual extents are of the intended extents are of the Williams Village Center? 
Yeah, so I looked into that and um, I wasn't able to find anything specific that delineated the exact boundaries. Um, my take on it after looking at all the other designated um, or designated neighborhood centers in the comp plan and how they're um, shown and how they're titled is that um, all of these areas that are listed as neighborhood centers were already essentially developed as commercial um, prior to, you know, very early on, most most of them in the 70s. So they're listed as names that they're commonly known by, like Basemar, um, Williams Village, Diagonal Plaza, University Hill District, et cetera. So, and then looking at the zoning map, um, which largely corresponds, like BC2 or M MU zoning is generally applied to all the areas that are shown as neighborhood centers. It It seems to me that the way that the dots are basically intended to represent um, kind of well-known commercial areas um, mm -hmm. and all the properties that are included within the, whatever they're named. So like Basemar doesn't have, doesn't specify the exact addresses. There's multiple par parcels in Basemar, um, but the zoning kind of applies to the whole shopping center. So in, from what I can tell, it seems that it was just kind of intended to um, apply to the sites as we know them, if that makes sense. Okay, so your conclusion is that it would apply to the entire triangle. That's correct. Okay, which includes this site plus diagonal crossing plus McDonald's. Yes. Okay. Baseline, baseline not diagonal. No. Sorry, baseline. Yeah, baseline. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew I knew what you meant. You know. What, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. And then last question. Um, no, I'll hold off on the last question uh, after I talk to the, after I ask the applicants. Okay, thanks. So, thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go to the folks who are online. Um, George and then ML. Uh, mine should be quick. I, uh, Chandler, um, quick question for you regarding um, when you, when you had that, um, when you had that building height context map up, um, and, and you were talking us through the presentation, basically outside of the the parcels that are the CU dormitories and apartments, everything is uh, roughly one and three store one to three stories that abuts the site. Is that correct? Um, yes, aside from Williams Village, and and Williams Village, just to uh, just to refresh my memory, Williams Village is. CU uh, land. So when those were built and, and the way those are set up is Boulder has no control over the height of those buildings, correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. Uh, that's that's all I wanted. Thanks. Thanks, George. Um, ML? Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I have a, a number of questions. So just to talk briefly about the zoning, Chandler, my understanding is, according to the Boulder Valley Comp Plan land use, it's an MUB, but that was never rezoned, so it remains a BC2? That's correct. And BC2 zoning is predominantly retail? Um, yes, it's predominantly retail. It's, it's intended to um, be predominantly retail and to to be kind of neighborhood serving retail and uh, personal service uses. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, I, uh, so do we know, I think that there, the question came ahead of time for you as well. Um, the proposed uses and square footage, how do the proposed uses and square footage compare to those being displaced? So are we getting more, less, or the same amount of services that are currently provided in this proposal? Yeah, so I can, um, I mean, I'm sure that the applicant is going to discuss that in detail, but okay. based on um, our numbers, the the existing amount of commercial space on the site is about 66,000 square feet. And all told, um, they'll be providing uh, upwards of 75,000 square right. feet. Right. So it, it would be actually more commercial space than is currently on the site. Okay. Emil, can I say... Um colloquy on that sure. earlier you said it was 65 or 66,000 not including the broker is that what you said 
Um, no, I think it's it's just sixty six thousand. So the broker is a hotel, which isn't retail, is a that's about the same size as the as the new hotel that they're proposing. So the ho hotel replacement will be about one one to one. I see. Um, so you were only talking about the non hotel space. Okay, correct. Thank you. Go ahead, Emma. Um. So a uh, code wise or zoning wise, um, the hotel use, it was kind of confusing because some of the information was old and I think the ordinance to the use table changed things in the interim. So just to clarify, the hotel, is the hotel use now allowed given no. to the use table change or has that not happened? That has not happened. And that's something, um, I was able to speak with the applicant about, um, and I'm sure that they'll address as well in their presentation, but yeah, hotels are currently prohibited in BC2. Um, and according to the applicant, it's it's really kind of a, they're putting it out there as a potential kind of third phase um, addition to the site if, you know, the, the use table or the zoning is changed um, between now and when that phase happens, which would likely um, not be for quite a while. Got it. Thank you. Um, last question. Um, the staff noted that the proposed site access is not consistent with code requirements. Um, did the applicant have a response to that? Um, yes, and, and I'm sure they'll discuss that as well. But I think um, in general, so we can allow more than one access point, but it has to basically be justified through a traffic study during the site review process. So they have to ask formally for an exception to the design and construction standards. Um, they didn't really get into, you know, whether they were going to be asking for that or not. And as I mentioned before, they, the concept plan didn't really show the final subdivision layout. So when we were looking at it, we were looking at it as, as one big site essentially with um, seven access points or whatever. But theoretically, if they were to subdivide the site so that each of those buildings sat on its own lot, then each of those lots could have its own independent yeah. access point. Um, so the access is definitely something that will require a, a lot more um, analysis and kind of details during site review to figure out. But yes, currently, if if it is one site, just looking at it kind of at face value, um, currently it doesn't meet access standards and the proposal as shown also does not meet access standards. Okay. Thank you so much, Chandler. That, th those are all my questions. All right, thanks, ML. Mark? No, sorry. Uh, Laura, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, Chandler. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Could you Thanks. pull back up the uh, diagram of the site as the applicant wants to build it, the proposed site plan? Yes. I have just a couple questions that uh, hoping you could point out some things on that diagram. Sure. Um, does this work or do you want a bigger one? Uh, that one will work. That's good. Um, so in the packet, it noted that some of the open space was rooftop decks. And I want to make sure that I'm understanding, and I'm reading this correctly, which of these green spaces are rooftop decks and which ones are not, which ones are ground level. Could you particularly point out the ones that are ground level and not elevated? Um, yes. And some of them you can't really see. Actually, let me, let me go to... Um... Just a full overhead error. There we go. Even so, better. Thank you. I'm not sure. Can you see my mouse? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so yeah. So this is rooftop um, down here, building D, upside down L. That's a plaza. That's ground level. Um, over here, I'm building D. This is rooftop. And then the whole area between building D and building E is shown as a kind of park slash plaza area. <laughs> and then um, building E here, which is the student housing, um, all of these areas that are kind of in the, uh, I guess, crooks of the building or bends of the building, these triangle spaces. Elbows. <laughs> Elbows, yeah. Um, with the multi-use path going through, all of these are at grade. Um, and then the two that have the, um, brown surrounding them. Those are both rooftop. So I think that's indicating kind of railings. And then, yeah, I mean, the, the rest is essentially kind of landscape setbacks um, surrounding the buildings. 
Thank you, that's very helpful. And then <clears throat> I think this diagram will work for my next question as well. So in the memo, it talks about staff feels that there are height transitions that are needed. Can you point out if you have thought about this in, in this level of specific geographic detail, where you think those height transitions are needed, which edges would need to come down? Yeah, I mean, generally, I think the um, staff feels that along baseline, so the the building frontages that are directly facing the one and two story buildings across the street. Um, so kind of the the northeast corner of building A, um, building C, um, basically just creating um, a slightly uh, lower elevation along baseline. Okay, so specifically along baseline, was that the only area that staff was had a, a thought about making a transition of height? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, the, the transition criteria um, kind of speak to surrounding neighborhoods. So generally, you know, it's, it's on the border of the site that is um, closest to those surrounding neighborhoods. So yes, along baseline really is, is mainly, I think, where we were thinking of. Okay, and, and your mouse was on that building that's kind of behind the baseline crossing shopping center. I'm assuming that that's not an area since it's behind a shopping center that you would need height transition or were you including that? No, I mean, we didn't specify. I think in general, staff just felt that um, the mass seemed a bit big considering um, the immediate kind of context across the street to the north. Um, so I think we would you know, we didn't specify in our comments exactly which buildings we thought needed to come down. I don't think we usually get into that level of detail and concept plan, but um, I think in general, the, the thought was where there are existing one or two story buildings to make buildings adjacent to those spots um, kind of transition to that scale. Okay, thank you. And I'll have some thoughts about those later, but I'll save them for, for comments. Um, Next question, how tall is that retaining wall on US 36 and that ramp that's right behind the, the edge of the property there? Yeah, so um, now I can show some of the pictures that I got. Um, so it's not, I'm not exactly sure precisely how tall it is, but I think it's about 25 to 30 feet at its tallest point and it gradually goes up. So I'm gonna just show some pictures here to illustrate. Um, so this is looking from Cafe Mexicali with the retaining wall shown there. So you can see right there, the retaining wall is above the, the first floor. This is also looking basically from the um, baseline crossing parking lot. Um, the whole site is, so on the, the western portion of the site is basically below the grade of the highway for the entire time. So this is looking from um, the dark horse, essentially right where the highway starts to go up. So there it's only probably eight feet or so. This is all the way back by the broker in, but even there you can see there's an existing kind of retaining wall and then a berm and then the path and then another berm and then the road. Um, this is showing looking across the street, looking across baseline to the south. So that's the tallest point of the retaining wall that you can see there where the, the very large berm is. And you can see it's almost level with the top of Mexicali, um, which is a two-story building. So um, the applicant may have specific numbers. I'm not sure if they've measured it or not, but um, just based on you know visual data, I would say that it's 25, possibly 30 feet tall. Um, Thank you. Yep. That's perfect. I love the images. Thank you. That's so helpful. I, I did do a site visit, but maybe not everybody was able to do that. This is my neighborhood, by the way, like I, this is a place I know well, so it's good to have the visuals. Thank you. Um, and my last question, if I may, uh, for Chandler. So on page 182 of the packet, you have a statement that says staff encourages the applicant to rethink the project in terms of the maximum number of units that could be provided because of a, a bunch of factors. Some of those factors I get, but I had questions about, um, you talk about meeting city access and transportation standards and floodplain development requirements. Can you explain a little bit why city access and transportation standards and floodplain development requirements would, in staff's opinion, require fewer units of residential? 
Um, I think, in, you know, the, the general feeling among staff was that um, with the detail that we've been given, the project seemed to be trying to fit quite a bit um, into the existing space and that as shown, the number of access points that they are saying that they need to serve these buildings, which are predominantly residential, would be very difficult for us to accommodate. Um, we had concerns about, you know, traffic impacts, um, safety impacts, floodplain, et cetera, they would, they'd be required to get a, both a clomer and a loamer, um, and redirect the floodplain, which they have thought about and which I'm sure they're going to talk about in their presentation as well. Um, but really the feeling was just that it seemed like this was, um, not, maybe not 10 pounds in a five pound sack, um, but maybe, maybe seven pounds in a five pound sack. Um, so, so the way that was, um, Phrase, you know, I guess I shouldn't have phrased it that way in terms of um, number of units, but um, basically just saying that overall, um, if this number of access points are required to serve a development of this size, that the development should likely be smaller because the existing street infrastructure surrounding the site currently would not be able to handle um, that type of access configuration. Okay, thank you. It's good to know your rationale on that. Appreciate it. That's the end of my questions. Hi, Chandler. Um, I'm going to follow up with uh, Kurt's questions about private and public streets. Um, uh, it seems as though uh, I'm, I'm clear and with all the advantages of having uh, public streets and dedicated city right of way so that there's not future issues with, like you say, maintenance, access, et cetera. So I'm all about uh, that. However, we have some recent examples of both where I think a private street was able to be designed much more creatively and with, uh, I think, better, uh, a better product in terms of tr helping us try to reach uh, some transportation and climate goals. And I'm referring to uh, what I think is a private street and the applicant can probably correct me here if I'm wrong, um, uh, 34th Street between Meredith and Bluff. It's a street I like to use as an example often as really kind of a new and very different sort of street cross section. Uh, it's just south of Valmont. Um, so that's a private street, I believe. Is that correct, Chandler? Or applicant? I'm not sure. Okay. Anyway, let me let me get to the heart of the question. Do we ever allow variation from the DCS for a street that would eventually do we can we negotiate variation from the DCS for a street cross section that wouldn't meet the DCS but would eventually become a public street? I believe that we can. Um, I would probably like to follow up with engineering and get you a written response. Um, and I apologize if it looks like I'm rolling my eyes or something. I have two screens right now. One is just above the other one. <laughs> um, so I have, I'm looking up at my big screen, which has other information on it. Um, I, I so interpreted it as, as the usual response I get when I ask <laughs> questions, but <laughs> not from um, you, but for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, so um, I, I believe that we can make modifications to the DCS. If you don't mind, I would just like to read um, Edward's response to the overall question about whether we decide um, if we'd prefer a new street to be public or private. So there are several issues to look at when considering if it is a public street or a private drive. The first is to look at the subdivision standards in 91212 that prohibit private streets. Next is to look at the function to determine if it is a street or a driveway. This, inclu this includes, is the frontage needed to meet lot standards? Does it serve multiple parcels under different ownership? Does it provide connections to other properties or streets? Does it provide through access to users beyond the lots served? Trade-offs relate to ownership, operations, and maintenance. When it is a private street, the city has limited or no operations or maintenance responsibility, but also limited to no control over how it is operated and the condition. 
when it serves what appears to be a public need that creates public expectations of the city that we may not be able to meet. Reasons for development to have private streets include building to a lesser standard than the city requires for a public street, which lowers initial costs, but tends to create costs and problems in the longer term. If it is a private driveway, we want it constructed to appear as such, including using drive cuts rather than intersections. Um, so it sounds like, I mean, that was really just more, more of an answer to whether we want it to be public or private. And in this case, I think with all those considerations, like I said before, we want it to be public. As far as modifications to the DCS standards to allow for, you know, more um, creative street layout or something, um, that I would want to um, follow up with engineering and get you a response later on because I'm not sure of the answer. Okay. So it is possible to modify the DCS. We've done it in the past. Um, you know, I think there needs to be a level of comfort in meeting the site review criteria. Um, I think from a transportation safety perspective, you know, there needs to be a level of comfort, but it, it's possible. Okay. So the follow on question to that is similar in the sense of we here we have a proposed development that has seemingly obvious access issues and, and people have asked about these access issues. So, but the developer doesn't control access on, on baseline or on 30th. And the developer can't say, I, I'm going to build a signalized intersection at 20, at the equivalent of 29th street. So, but the developer says, gee, under site review criteria and with approval, I can do X number of units, have X number of people here, have X trip count. Where does, uh, where does the city and how, how do we negotiate uh, prior to site review a, an agreement to create a signalized intersection and at whose expense and you know, how do we go about this? Because there's a little bit of a chicken or the egg thing here uh, between creating a signalized intersection and providing good access for an appropriate number of, of units. And we can't, we don't want to uh, restrict a housing supply based on kind of a, uh, a, an unfortunate condition on the current streetscape. So there, there is um, a city CIP project that's planning uh, crossing improvements on baseline this year. Um, so there would be an opportunity for the applicant or the developer to reach out and get involved in those discussions. Um, whether we would prefer it to be after they've submitted for site review or prior to site review, um, I can't really say, but I would imagine that we, could, we would at least start having that discussion with them um, prior to site review if necessary. And I think ultimately um, it's really going to depend on the traffic impact study that's submitted as part of the site review that is going to dictate whether or not we'd signalize that, that intersection, whether or not the impacts would justify it. Um, so I think that'll probably be our best first glimpse into um, what that might look like. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, applicant. You'll have 15 minutes. Oh, you're not Bill. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. True up. And can you guys run the clock for me so I can see it? And please give your name and et cetera. Oh. And I can at least start to save time for everybody. Oh, okay. Well, we haven't started. We haven't started to 15 minutes yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a lot of visual requests. I have a this is slide. truly hybrid. Like the whole time. you're here and you're online. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll start by at least introducing myself since I'm not Bill. Let's um, just make sure that they have the tech sorry. stuff so we don't waste any of your time. Yeah, no, I'm I'm waiting for. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had that was at zero before. Yeah, so I just don't want to start the clock till their tech stuff's working. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank 
But it works just fine. Are we ready? I'm ready. All right, go ahead. Let's please. start the time. Um, <laughs> Bill and I are going to split the 15 minutes, so I'll try to keep it brief. I will say one thing, just uh, since just there was give us so your much. Name. Uh, I'm sorry. My name is Andy Bush, and I'm with Morgan Creek Ventures. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about us as I use my four or five minutes. But um, and I am going to say one thing about access, since there's been so much discussion. We've developed a dozen buildings in Boulder Junction as part of it at 30th and Pearl. And, and I think it's important to realize that that whole area is really served by two public access points. So um, as we get into site review and discussion, we'll obviously go into the detail of that and the transportation studies and making sure that we support those access points. Um, thank you for hearing us tonight as part of it. And um, we didn't play a numbers game to try and get people out, but we did get people, ask people to talk if they wanted to. And so there'll be people who talk about it. And obviously the majority of letters that you got in support um, came in from people who think it's a good idea. Um, mostly, I think we just wanted to get your input tonight and we want to hear what staff has to say. I'd love to hear what folks in the neighborhood have to say. And, and the reason I wanted to slide up is because I want people to think about what is it we're talking about. I mean, it's really a, an old 70s shopping center that's 100% paid and impervious. Um, and just think about that and look up every once in a while while we talk and, and kind of keep that in mind as part of it. I want to talk about four things and I'll do it in four minutes, hopefully. One is the Williams family who owns um, the center. And they're really three generations here in Boulder. Um, not only did they develop this shopping center, but they've made significant donations to CU. They actually developed Martin Acres and the, I think it's called the Park East neighborhood as part of it. And they built in Gun Barrel. And their desire is kind of as a legacy, see the redevelopment of the shopping center. So I think we're really lucky to have a local family and local ownership that wants to see the transition and, and this as a family legacy. Um, our team, Morgan Creek Ventures is a urban infill developer focused on sustainability and urbanism. Um, I founded it 23 years ago here in Boulder. I've lived here for 50 and Bill and I have done a dozen um, all electric, highly sustainable buildings that produce about 40 or 50% of their own power. I think it's the largest kind of sustainable portfolio in Colorado. And, and we focus on urban infill. And so I think we understand urban context and scale. And it's worth mentioning that um, however many pounds of whatever we're putting in whatever bag, the FAR we're proposing is 1.9. Um, the FAR out uh, on what's being done um, at 30th and uh, or 28th and diagonal is about 1.8. Um, Boulder Junction in that neighborhood is about the same. So what we're really talking about is kind of trying to urbanize those neighborhoods in the way that we've been talking about doing them and have done very successfully, I think, here. Um, so put in context kind of FAR and, and pounds and, and bags and stuff as part of it. I think from a landscape standpoint, um, we've done very urban infill projects and Bill will show some diagrams about landscape and trying to look at what's on the ground plane and what we're trying to move up and how we're trying to transition things, but we'll um, exceed city standards and create great streets and, and great plazas and great courtyards as part of it. Um, is this a good location for housing and retail that serves the neighborhood and the community? I can't think of one that's any better with the exception of the fact that um, it's surrounded by Highway 36 on one side. And as we talked about with those big elevation changes, it creates some issues. And we've got an arterial street on the other side um, and 150 foot towers on the other side. And it does transition to a single family neighborhood, but that transition is largely made through the student rental of those single family units on the Northeast corner of that intersection. Um, and so I think the real question is one of mix and scale. And I think we demonstrated and hopefully will demonstrate that we can create the kind of scale and transitions. And I think some of the comments that Chandler and others have made about looking at baseline and the transition on baseline, I think we're open to. And the same thing, we want a really vibrant retail area. And the question is, can we create retail um, that's compact enough that it's successful? Those two neighborhood centers haven't done so great over the last 15 or 20 years, but I think we can do something really cool. I don't want to do more than is appropriate, but we've talked about, I think, 75 or 80,000 square feet. There may be a couple opportunities to do a little bit more. 
And finally, I'll talk about the elephant or the dark horse in the room. Um, the dark horse has been there for a long time and the Williams family has had a 40 year relationship with them <clears throat> and the ownership group as part of it. And we have a memorandum of understanding that really talks about the fact that, you know, this is a 40 year relationship and it's been a collaborative one. And, and the reality is the family has been subsidizing them for um, 15 or 20 years. And I think we're open to looking at a new site and trying to find a dark horse 2.0 that evolves at the right scale and the right size and I've been involved in building things that you could actually move the significant components and catalog them and recreate them. And it wouldn't be the same thing. It would be different. Um, but, you know, there's nostalgia. I kind of remember Juanita's and Potter's and I love the Blue Note. Um, I don't know if a lot of people even remember the Blue Note, but it, things transition and change. And I'd like to see us create a transition here. I'll pass out the memorandum of understanding while Bill's setting up. And I'd be glad at some point during your question and answer to read it into the record so that everyone who's going to talk tonight can understand it too, instead of waiting to find out about it when they get it online later. Um, but it took me two and a half minutes to read, so I wasn't going to take up that part of my time. But. All right, Bill, just so you know, you're at 8.56. Thanks. All right, so I'm the urban planning side of this. The site is a parking lot. There's absolutely no um, provision made for anybody on foot or on bike or any kind of alt mode, unless you drove there. So it's a broken part of our urban fabric as a community. Um, Bill Holicky, Coburn Architecture, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so uh, trying to make the technology work. So there's the site, Chandler already talked about it. One thing to note is that we have thousands of students walking through the site every day. Um, that is an energy that is hard to find and it's pretty cool. And if we can use it to make a really functioning neighborhood, that'd be great, but right now, um, they're either walking through a parking lot or uh, along 36. It's not a very pleasant experience, which is doubly made challenging because it is really, really well served by all modes, bike lanes, bus. And this is one of the components of neighborhood centers where we're in the BBCP where it talks about it really should have great alt mode service. It's great right up to the site. It's like the opposite problem that we normally have. Normally we can make the site great, but it doesn't tie to anything. The site's terrible and it ties to everything. So it's something we can fix. We start with this. This is a completely asphalted site with some buildings in the middle. It's the opposite of what you want from an urban form standpoint. And across the country, you're starting to see people reclaim these areas. We did it at Diagonal Plaza together as a community. And that was also a neighborhood center. That was about 1.88 FAR and it was 55 feet. So it's very similar to what's being proposed here in terms of the, the restitution of the urban fabric maybe is a, is a good way to look at it. The streets have been a big topic of conversation. Please ask about them. The blue one is proposed to be public. The other street accesses are not important. We want to meet the transportation requirements and work with what your recommendations are and what transportation needs to keep the site safe. For example, like this one that's already existing up here, perhaps that's emergency vehicle only. It doesn't have public access. You know, there's things that we can do like that to reduce this number down to just the streets and the drives needed to serve the parcel. So please, let's, let's talk about what the right thing to do is and we don't have any ulterior motive. We wanna satisfy transportation staff. Once you have the street layout, we've broken down, like Chandler said, we've broken down the city grid, the super block into something that's walkable, permeable. We can make outdoor space in it. We wanna bring the blue, the buildings up to the street to make those outdoor rooms and plazas and, and urban places that people find really welcoming and inviting about um, really nice, nice neighborhoods and communities. And then uh, we surround that by open space. I'll talk more about that later in the interest of time. And the parking is entirely contained within the buildings. We will also have to have parking underneath the student building, but none of it's at surface, except for a very small amount on the north side of the site up here, up here, which is uh, by the new sprouts. So there's a bit of parking there predominantly to allow the flood um, to be made, remain unchanged, but also to give some public parking there. Everything else is hidden so that the urban fabric is preserved. And that leaves us with this sort of fine grid which is what you wanna see. It's really interesting. Look at the grid of the, of the finished product here and the streets and the sidewalks and the urban places, and then compare that to what's north across the street. So what's north has to change too, eventually to make this a really good neighborhood. So we want that to be the beginning of that, part of that pattern that we need for the, for the property. And what it does is it takes this, which looks small and asphalted and inhumane and turns it into something that's 
much more attractive that you can actually picture yourself standing in. And it's interesting because when you actually put in the streets, you start to see the scale of the 10 acres. Until then, it just feels like a parking lot, which is really interesting. So um, this is another thing. So I talked about the students moving through the site. The southern, the, the bottom of the page, that diagonal rust line is the, is the point of access right now. So the students would leave Williams Village Towers and, and the six-story buildings to the south of it. They'd come along this path, right, walking right along the retaining wall on 36, and then go underneath the underpass and into the, to the university. Or they walk right through the parking lot, which they do, and it's not awesome. But we want to propose to utilize that energy. It's really, really difficult, as we know, in a mixed, in a non-mixed use project, even in a mixed use project, to create traffic on the street at all times of day. It's just hard to do. Students are awesome because they don't have classes from eight to half five. They have classes at various times of the day. So they're active as a group all the time. Well, maybe they're active after 11, but the point is they're active all the time, right? Because of the different schedules. So you always have that, those people on the street. It's a great base for community. So by running this alternate multi-use path through the site, which is the zigzag line above, we get to have those students on the site supporting the, the uses. And this comes back to those uses that we talked about. So the, what we really, what we found is that the, this site, if you know it well, it has struggled to keep people in business here. There are a few uses that are, have been there a long time. The dark horse, which you'll see from the letter has, had, has been paying half rent for a long time and they're a month to month lease. So please ask us about the dark horses, a lot that has gone into trying to keep them on the site at all, let alone with the redevelopment. Um, so, but the other businesses have turned over historically and have struggled and have underperformed. The reason for that is the only reason you come to this site is if you get in your car and drive here, there is no reason to come any other, there's no like incidental traffic, there's no foot track, no, nobody lives here. Um, all the students have meal plans, so they don't populate the restaurants. So we need to bring people to the site to keep this commercial healthy. So what we did was we said, okay, let's concentrate all the commercial on this street right here with a dark horse and pink at the end. And by the way, there's other restaurants planned. We would want to keep all of them, including the Dairy Queen even, if possible. And they would just be in the blue, but dark horse is special. So we identified it at the end of this plaza as a special use in pink. That's where we'd love it to go. And this street become, gets all the energy of that, of all the new users on the site. But that's not critical. We just thought that could better support this commercial because it struggled so much. We did this option after talking with planning board, with planning staff and hearing the community. This is also possible. This could be the commercial on the site if, if the staff, the community and planning board feels that this is more appropriate. The benefit is that there's more- I'm sorry, what could be the commercial? The, in the blue. Okay. So the difference is we would, we would change some of these spots from yellow, you know, from uh, this potential hotel and, and some of the residential to the blue. And that would create more commercial on site. Essentially, most of the first floor would be commercial. Um, the downside would be maybe there isn't enough financial support for those. The upside would be it's more in line with the comp plan with the neighborhood, um, neighborhood center. So I think we're open to either. We'd love your feedback on what makes more sense. Just wanted to throw that out. Also, as Chandler mentioned, the architecture we're not set on. We know it has to have a great first floor, first 12 to 14 feet. We think it should be modern. We'd love to hear your thoughts on style. And the same is true for landscape. In these pictures, we've shown two different kinds. One is really geometric. And that kind of matches the ge geometric streets and the buildings. The other kind is much more sinuous, and that's kind of what we've shown on the open space plan. So it's a juxtaposition of the kind of the natural versus the urban. Again, your thoughts on that would be very helpful, along with staffs and neighbors and everybody else's. Um, you've seen as we've kind of, you've looked through architectural character sketches, really the intent is not to show building um, architecture. We haven't designed it yet. It's really just to explain that this is a very different place than what's there now. And you've seen some of this place making in other projects around Boulder, that's the intent. And these little caught plazas, like you can see here, these, little, these um, urban places are a really great place for the community to interact and for people to go back and forth and meet each other and, and develop that community. Um, is I'll skip right to height. This is not horizontally correct, but it is vertically to scale. So the street, 36 five lane highway, 25 feet about tall, 20 to 30 feet at the retaining wall, our proposal in the middle, and then the towers on the right. And that's literally the way it lines up across the site. So keep in mind that the site review criteria have us look at what's around. The neighborhood center says we're supposed to transition. Diagonal Plaza, it's all 55 feet and it's transitioning down to what's around it. 
The opposite is true here. We're actually transitioning up to the towers. We're transitioning up to the bulk and mass of the five lane highway that's 30 feet above the ground. And our site is here in blue. So red is above 55 feet, blue is 55 feet. Remember the entire east side of 36 as you head north is all 55 foot tall students, uh, student buildings. And everything to the north is zoned right now 30, about 35 to 40 feet by right. I have like two slides to get okay, through, if that's okay. I'll be very quick. Um, we can talk more about any of this stuff in questions. The flood came up. So we have designed, um, I can talk more about this really briefly. We've designed the street plan, not about just about urban placemaking, but also about the flood. So you can see that the streets follow very closely the way the flood currently moves through the site. So it doesn't require much grading to modify that just a little bit so it fits outside of the buildings. This is showing the 100 year floodplain, which is the regulatory start for a floodplain. Um, the open space, there was some question about what was above ground and what was at grade. The bright green is at grade, the dark, green is above ground. There is a new site review criteria that we're all just learning these site review criteria, but there's a new one that says, if you're in an area where there's views, you it is strongly suggested that you put at least some open space up in the air so that the residents can and, and the users of the community can take advantage of those views. So we are reading the site review criteria to require us to move some of the site uh, open space up. And then, oh boy, now I've done it. Um, lastly, parking, there's some street parking. Um, the orange is the hidden parking inside the building. There would be other parking under the student. Uh, this is important. I, I think I only have one more after this. The light blue and the medium blue are the first chunk of work. That's phase one and phase two. It all happened at the same time. Purple is future. So the idea was all of the commercial that's currently on site would be preserved. We'd add to it a little bit, go from 65,000 to 75 or 80,000 of commercial or more if you choose. Um, but there's hotel on the site. We know it's not allowed, but if the planning board council really strongly desired it, we have a spot for it. If you don't desire it, it could be dealt with in the third phase of purple. We'd have to come back for another site review amendment to do anyway, so there's plenty of time to figure that out. And then lastly, uh, that's it. So right. thank thanks, Val. Um, okay, we'll take uh, clarifying questions from the board members. Um, can you take down that? Uh, slide so I can see ML and George. And while we're waiting for that to come, if you came in late and you haven't and you want to speak, you have to sign up over at that table and you'll have two minutes when we get to comments. Okay. Uh, who has questions, clarifying questions for Bill? Huh? Look at that, you those extra two minutes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I was strong. like, we're so we're close. So excited. <laughs> Hi, Bill. I'll get you an ML. Thank you. And your colleague, remind me your name. Andy. Bush. Say again. Andy Bush. Andy. Bill and Andy, thank you for that presentation. Very informative. Appreciate it. I have just a couple of questions. Sure. So in the applicant statement, you talk about an amphitheater. And you also talk about having food trucks, markets, or events in the parking area. Can you show us where the amphitheater is and talk about that a little bit, what your intentions are there, and also talk about how you envision that parking space by Sprouts would function for food trucks, markets, or events? Sure. Um, just give me a second here. Okay. So this area right here that sits between the student housing and um, this potential dark horse location is really important to us. The, there was visioning done at the outset by the owner. They've been working on this for a long time. They own it, they want it to be really special. By the way, the very first thing that they said when we walked in was we have to figure out how to keep the dark horse on site somehow. So, I mean, this is not an afterthought. So we decided that this amphitheater could be the kind of the nexus of the community, like this community heart. And it sits right here. Um, it we, we located it right where the, the floodway is. No water went over that during the big rain, but it is on paper a floodway. So it need to be open anyway. So the idea is we can put the dark horse there. We can put food trucks there. It can be outdoor events and concerts, kind of like the belly up in Aspen, you know, that kind of thing. The student housing across the way is really cool because again, students are there all the time. At least some students are in their common space at all times. So that first floor could be that common space that students have. And then that whole area would be charged sort of at all hours of the day is the idea. And so this is a, a little bit of a rendering looking into that. There's no building design yet at all. 
It's just this idea that there's this plaza with catenary lighting, places for food trucks, all that kind of stuff. So that answers that part. And then briefly, your other question, which is up here. Um, again, the area, this, this area here is, it's not a ton of parking. It's a little bit of parking, like the idea that if you think you might be able to park there, you'll drive there and then you can't. So you park in the garage, but since it could be designed almost like a wound earth, it could be closed off and you could do farmer's markets and events and food trucks there. Um, Sprouts being more of a community market, it would be something that they could sponsor and support and be right on baseline. So everybody could see this community event. So that's the idea. And again, it's early, so we're open to thoughts, concepts, you know, good idea, bad idea, other ideas. Okay, thank any you. More, any more questions? Yeah, I have just one more. Okay. Um, can you take that down just so I can see our other colleagues? Yeah, Thanks. so in the packet, it, um, it said that staff encouraged you folks, the applicant, to provide additional information on what discussions, if any, have been had with existing tenants regarding possible retention or relocation to new space within the project. You've talked about that a little bit. I just wanted to invite you to talk about it more if you have more to say. Yeah, it's been it's been quite extensive. I'm going to turn it over to Andy, who's been heading that up. Thank you. And I think, you know, this is, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, this is a chess game, right? Not a checkers game, because there's also the dimension of time here. We've got existing tenants. We've got master leases. We've got lots of different users. And we have to build this in over a period of time. And it's realistic. It's that folks are going to have to close and reopen or shuffle and move. And it's not easy because I've tried to do it before. So I don't want to suggest that it's an easy thing to do. But the ownership is open to having all of the tenants that are there ultimately be there in the long run. There really isn't a bad tenant in there. Um, that doesn't have some relationship to students, you know, for whether it's Dairy Queen or Moe's or the barbecue place or Sprouts or the Dark Horse. Our preliminary discussions with Sprouts have been that they're willing to close for two years if they can move and be over on the corner. And I think the owner of that master lease may talk as part of the public comment. Um, the Dark Horse, we've also said, you know, we'd love to find that the Dark Horse doesn't need to be the size that it is. Um, they couldn't sustain that from a rent standpoint, and they don't really utilize that most of the time. But part of putting them on that plaza space in the outdoor is they do, during games and other stuff, have big spillover potential requirements that they'd love to have in more of a semi-public space. Um, so we've looked at timing. We're looking at their different needs for kind of next generation of business. And there's no reason, and we would love to have all of the tenants stay there there's a practical reality that probably all of them won't. And cause I don't want to come up and, and say all this is going to happen. Um, and, and Dave who owns the dark horse is seven years old. He's my age or a little bit older. Um, so yeah, there's also 70. generations of businesses here that just, you know, you have to transition ownership to the next team in your business to make some of these businesses go on. But I think the, the most important point is we're open to that. And I think if, um, folks from Sprouts or the Dark Horse are on tonight and talk, or if not in future communications, you know, this is a conversation and it's one that is a chess game, but it's an interesting chess game because all of those, you know, I wish we could buy McDonald's. That's probably the only one I'd close, um, but we don't have McDonald's. So the rest of them we think could be really good fit. And again, if it comes to the point in public comment or something, feel free to read the MOU with the Dark Horse. Cause I know a lot of people, have been talking about Save the Dark Horse. I think the Williams family has done more to save the Dark Horse in the last 15 or 20 years than any group, and, and they're still excited about trying to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, ML? Thank you so much. Um, so I've got um, a number of questions for the applicant. Let me see where... Um, So you've got two kinds of residences that you're creating. One is for students and one is for uh, market rate. Um, how many students, uh, and when I look at the square footage, they were about the same square footage. Um, and you were providing one parking space per unit in your parking um, layout or parking proposal. So my question is, 
how many students do you see per unit? Yeah, that's so loaded question. Um, first of all, I don't, you know, we, we've ex said, hey, this is residential square footage, this is student square footage, this is market rate. I don't think we've done the math to figure out or done the design to figure out exactly this many beds or exactly this many units. So that's one of the things we want to ask you about. Um, it's likely to be, say, three and four bed student units, just because that works pretty well. That's, that's people like to pair up in triples and quads and things like that, but it wouldn't be exclusively that. And, um, you know, the idea for parking in terms of asking how many parking spaces per unit, originally we had this idea that the parking garage was going to be the parking. We were going to have a fairly substantial parking uh, reduction and that we were going to share that residential commercial parking in the parking garage. Because you can do this daytime, nighttime shift, right? Um, the residents typically park in the evening and night hours, the, the commercial parks during the day, so you can overlap that parking. But the reality is um, when we really got into the student housing to understand that what, what you have is not so much a car use problem, but you have a car storage problem. Students mm -hmm. show up with cars and then mm -hmm. they, they leave them somewhere. So that's why I said, I, um, I'm fairly comfortable saying we will need to do subsurface parking for car storage for the students under the student housing building. Right. So I, um, I think you've answered my number one question here, which is, out of those 285 student units, you could potentially have, and that's at three per unit, you could potentially have 855 students living in those buildings, right? Three. Yeah, that's that's probably times 200. So that's a lot of a lot of people on the site. So that that's just one of my questions. Um, following up with that um, is. So if we end up with uh, 855 students and however many residents based on the regular apartments, uh, and I think from the numbers that I that we got earlier, the amount of services that currently exist on the site, you're proposing more, but it's not like double or, or triple. It's just, uh, I don't remember what percentage more. Um, so my question is uh, how you're adding over a thousand people to the site as residents. How are the services that will support, where will the services that will support this so that it doesn't become a car dependent development? Yeah. Right now we've got the amount of services and there's no additional residents, right? Um, right now there aren't any residential on site. So we're bringing in a significant number of people yeah. and not adding, you know, that many more services. Am I to understand from the conversation we've had that those number of additional residents on the site might make this economically viable for the businesses that have been struggling on that site. And so anyway, I think you yeah, understand my question. <laughs> I do. And I can be, and I can be brief. Yeah. I think that you're, you hit the nail on the head. You know, we've done steel yards, we've done, um, you know, 30 pro we've done some other developments. And what we found is it's surprisingly hard to support commercial with just the units on the site, no matter how many units you put on. Um, so we are, I'll just say, I am nervous that if we increase beyond, say, that 75, 80,000 square foot level of commercial, that they would be supported even with the additional units on site. Um, that said, we did, it, it might be possible to do that. And I think that's a question that we would ask you to take up and, and give us your feedback on. So this was the original proposal that we submitted. And this is the 75, 77,000, so I think it's 77,000 square feet of commercial, which is shown here. But this is an alternate that we've worked up after talking with staff that shows, you know, a good bit more commercial. And this is probably in the 120,000 square foot range. And I'm guessing, so please don't quote me on that number. But if this feels more appropriate to planning board, then I think we would explore that pretty hard to figure out how to get that kind of commercial on the site and how to, to find users that would make that financially viable. So, um, and I'll stop the share so you can, everybody can see each other, but, uh, yeah, I think that's that's feedback that we would really like 
Um, and then lastly, I do think I feel better about supporting the commercial when it's more concentrated. Um, so I think that's the trade-off. Do we want a commercial that we're sure is gonna be viable? Or do we want more commercial that might be a little harder to support? But um, open to your thoughts. Okay. Thank you um, for that clarification answer. I think I have one more question. Um, phasing. So you're proposing three phases on the project. And so my question is, it looks like, um, it looks like you will deconstruct only per phase and the rest of the site will continue functioning during um, phases. And it looks like number one phase is you build the student housing before any of the commercial. Is that correct? I'm going to turn it over to Andy. The intention is that phase one and two are a bit more um, simultaneous than that, but I'll pull up the phasing map. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and I would start by saying we don't totally know yet, but the to do phase one and to do any of this, we have to, um, I'm, I'm sorry, to do any of this, we probably have to take Sprouts building down. So that would be the first thing to be taken down. And then we would start on the main roadways because we'd need the main roadway to baseline and we'd need the, we have to do all the flood work as part of the first phase. So that park would be part of the first phase, the main roadway coming down and the piece across in front of baseline for all of the flood work. And then really the idea is to build the student housing and um, the second phase at the same time and to be building sprouts so that it could open two years later about the same time the student housing would open. So the real phase that's really being talked about in the future is the purple phase. Um, mm -hmm. We've talked, we've, we've called them phase three. It's really more parcel identification almost than anything else, but the intent is to do phase one and two simultaneously. And I would be remiss, I, I should add that staff, a lot of this is very technical and staff will have a lot to say about how it's phased and what part it goes in. So I should defer a lot of that to staff as we go through the process. Thank you so much. Those are my questions for now. Thank you. Okay, and I just have one question. Um, what's your guarantee that it's actually going to be some student housing and some market housing, non-student housing? I mean, is it possible that you'll end up saying, you know what, we're just going to make it all student housing? Wow, that's a great question. And I'm like, as you say that, I'm ripping through the code in my head to figure out what could be put in the development agreement to, to require that. So I will say this. Um, we don't have any problem with you putting something in development agreement to require that. So I think I just defer to Charles. And, and I think we're open to trying to address that as part of site review development agreement. So I think we could do it there because we've done kind of similar things before, whether it's affordable. We did the first pilot affordable commercial project over at 30th and Pearl, and we did that through the development agreement. So I don't see why we couldn't do this through the development agreement also. And I, Charles was looking at, um, Lauren, in case there was a legal question. I think it's ultimately more of a legal question. Yeah, we'd want to look into it once we're writing up the development agreement okay. and see what's legal under our code. Okay, great. And is the, uh, the presumed market rate housing rentals? I don't think that's known yet. Um, we have discussed some for sale, but I, we don't have an answer to that question. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. Is any other last questions? Uh, go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, thanks. My first question is about the flood. So you're moving the flood plain or the, I don't know what how to call it, where the, the water goes. You're moving it a little bit, right, to avoid that building F, it appears. Yes. I don't know if we can bring yep, I'm on it. that up. Two seconds. Closing too many windows. Okay, that should pop up, yeah. Right, so I was a little confused by this because it seems like the, the, the diagrams, the colors are the same on the left and the right, but you're just showing they are the same because they're both the current. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so are you, is there anything that shows what the, the, the post build like conveyance zone would be? Not yet, just because we haven't talked to staff about it. But the okay. intention is that the, the, the location and the amount of water at each property line would not change. So the only thing that's changing is on the site. It's not changing the flow up or downstream at all. 
And all it's doing is really moving that north-south channel, this one here, it's moving it slightly to the east. Mm -hmm. So the intention on this slide was just to show that it's it was designed to be very similar and just with slight regrading that that can be, I don't even wanna say rechannelized because we're talking like two or three feet of difference here. Um, that has been brought up by staff. I'm pointing to Chandler who's at home, so sorry. <laughs> um, it has been brought up by staff and I think that would be one of the first follow-up sets of, of meetings is to work through that. The, the project cannot come back to planning board until a clomer has been approved by the city. So city would have to sign off on the change before we can either even see you again. And I should mention that Charlie from JBA did do the sections to show that we could do it essentially with those street sections that we've identified. So there's been preliminary engineering done on all that too. Okay. And, and did you consider, I'm definitely not a flood expert, so I don't know what is possible. And this is the question that I didn't ask staff, but did you consider rerouting it so that the that north south flow would go all the way up to baseline and not not create this open area the what you're using as an open area for parking and so on yeah i think that if the feedback from planning board is it would be better to bring the, the building to the street then we will work with st staff owns the city owns baseline so we don't want to change a single drop in baseline unless the city says that's a good idea. So if you guys say bring the building to the street and staff thinks that there's a good way to do that, we'll do it. Okay, sounds good. Um, I lost my question, so go to somebody else. I think you're it. No. Oh, I'm, oh no, sorry. I doubt I'm it. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I thought you already passed. No. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, um, I, although I don't think I'll be long. Um, on, in your, uh, in the packet, um, you have a radius, an aerial view with a radius showing some transportation corridors and bus stops, et cetera. There are two proposed RTD stations. Who, 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 who is proposing that? Is that RTD or you or, uh, or what? And, and are those for real? I, I'm, I'm just curious about those. Those are straight off the city transportation map, so I should um, defer to staff on that. Okay. And I, if staff, if it's helpful, I can share that slide quick. And that may be like a pre-COVID transportation master plan in need of an update. Anyway, I don't know. If, yeah, I think they're just straight out of the um, transportation master plan. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> in your market housing. Yes. Do you think, what, do you have a target AMI, or put it in a more real term, would an adjunct professor at CU be able to afford a one bedroom in your market rate housing with 30% of their income going to rent? So I would be lying if I told you how much an adjunct professor, professor at CU made. A surprisingly <laughs> small amount, but anyway. Um, I have taught there small amount, but. in a while. Um, okay, so uh, the, the intent from the very beginning of the conversations, the intent was to create um, a really diverse group of economic, um, well, a diverse economic group of, of residents. And so, uh, you know, we don't have, like I said, we haven't designed any units. We don't know what they are, but it's pretty important to the health of the neighborhood to have lower like workforce housing. I think there would also be like, you know, for lack of a better way to describe it, like the penthouse unit. So the idea is that there's a strata and that folks of varying economic backgrounds would be able to live there. Um, when you look at that many units and, and having that absorbed into the market, there's a reality there. If you just brought on a bunch of high-end units, it's gonna take a really, really long time to get them leased up initially. So the obvious market is CU employees, and that has been discussed a lot. So the, I, the intent would be to get CU employees in there, but I would be, it, would, it would not be accurate to say that's 100% of the market rate units. Okay. Um, last question. Um, do you have a rough percentage of open space that is linear, especially along 36 or along the streets versus non-linear plaza, uh, gathering area, amphitheater sort of percentage. 
It's a great question. Um, you're just trying to look at like, what is occupiable space versus what is more passive like tree lawns and things like that is a good question. And I, um, I don't, I probably should, but I would say that based on past projects and what we're seeing here, you know, I would say that probably 50% of the open space is in plaza areas, 25% is linear and 25% is up in the air. And that's a really, really rough number. Um, but again, your thoughts on that would be helpful as we move forward. I'll have thoughts on that. During I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, ready. that's it. Your final questions? Yeah, I think I just had one more question, which is about the design of that, uh, the, the student building. I think it's building E. Yes. The, the one that goes all over. Yeah. Uh, with the elbows. With the elbows. So that shows a number of, or not a number, it shows two ground level open space areas yep. on the west side, southwest side, yep. along the highway. What was your thinking in putting them there? And do you think that that would actually be pleasant space or would it be better to have them more internal? That's another really interesting question. So the broker inn is on the site right now and it's about 15, 20 feet below the highway. And it's got that pool area back there. And that actually is a pretty pleasant space to be to the point where it's being kind of utilized as a, like a club to some extent. So people like it. The other thing that's along that, it's not just the highway, but it's also that bike path, which is the primary circulation for the Williams Towers and the, and the six story buildings that I don't know the name of to the South to get to see you. So the idea was students like to be around students and the idea that you could be in those open spaces and be connected to this, this string of movement back and forth seems really attractive to students. Um, and also, you know, students by virtue of the fact that they're not gonna be there for more than three or four years and uh, they're kind of, um, what's the phrase? If it's too, it's too loud. You're too old. Um, they they seem to like the energy. So um, the the folks that we talk to that specialize in it, which is not me, um, feel like that would be a really energizing thing for the student housing. So that's what we've thought about so far. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys very much. Um, I'm going to make an executive decision. We'll take a five minute break. Uh, when we come back, uh, we'll start public comment. Again, if you haven't signed up, sign up over there and you'll each have two minutes to speak. Thank you. We'll be back. I don't have a, what time is it here? We'll be back at uh, 7.53.
All right, everybody, uh, we're going to start. Um, it's my understanding that a our, uh, planning professor, Bill Shutkin, is here, and some of you may be his students. Is that right? So, uh, welcome, welcome to City Planning 101. If you're students of Bill Shutkin's, raise your hands. Only one. Oh, a couple. All right. Um, okay, folks. So just uh, we have um, uh, lots of people signed up and uh, 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 at least 56 people listening online. I don't know how many hands are up online. So this is could be a very long evening. <laughs> I want you just to remind you that what we're discussing here, and then we have to discuss amongst ourselves, but we're not voting on anything tonight. We're not making any decisions tonight. All we're doing is giving feedback to the applicant uh, on the proposal that's in front of us and how we are how we see it vis-a-vis -vis the code and the Boulder Valley comp plan. So we're not voting on anything tonight. All right, so the first speaker is going to be Ken Farmer and you will have two minutes, Mr. Farmer. Thanks for, um, thanks for letting us come up here and give comment. I'm going to try to avoid speaking too fast and going into auction mode. <laughs> I live in Southwest uh, Martin Acres. Um, I bark, I bicycle into this area all the time. So I've, I've been to ha probably half the retail facilities here. Um, I love the ideas of mixed use. I love the idea of affordable housing. And I love the idea of revitalization. But I have some serious concerns about this proposal. Um, one is that it's a, it's a net reduction in the land dedicated to local um, serving businesses. And admittedly, the existing, the existing retail doesn't optimize, isn't well optimized for using the land either. But of course, this isn't the only possibility, what we looked at today. And having local, uh, local serving business is essential for people to walk, bike, and bus rather than drive everywhere. It's essential as a part of our vision. And it, I think, is essential if we're going to enter into meaningful conversations about reducing parking requirements. Because if we get rid of all the local serving business, then we're all just going to be driving everywhere. And we're going to need all those parking spots. Um, I'm very concerned that uh, a lot of the commercial space doesn't appear to happen until phase two and three. I'm concerned it may never actually emerge. Um, the second category of concerns is that uh, we might see this turn into uh, almost no af affordable housing or commercial space. Um, we Boulder doesn't really need a whole lot more luxury housing. I think every luxury housing unit that we add at this point just digs us deeper into a hole. We really need that housing for a single school teacher with a child, something that he or she can afford. And we don't really need more luxury boutique high-end retail where you buy a $700 winter shell. You know, we really need affordable retail. Sorry, I'm so sorry, your two minutes are up. Yeah. It goes very fast, so I'll just make prepared. one quick sure statement. finish My your last your final statement, and the most important is highway noise. Residents along, along Moorhead deal with, an, deal with a tremendous amount of noise. It's extremely unhealthy. We know about that. These tall buildings are gonna reflect a lot more noise back. And I think that we should have a very serious noise study. Great, thank you very much. Okay, next, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Guillaume Losri, Losek. Hi, my name is Guillaume Losek. Um, I am a research assistant at CU Boulder. I heard about the project a few months ago and I'm here to voice my concerns regarding the destruction of Dark Horse to build student housing. So let me first make it clear, uh, I, since uh, before I lived with my wife, rent represented 50% of my income, so I do see the value in affordable housing. However, I just want to make sure that in this project, the housing will remain affordable. Also, uh, when looking at the project, I believe the replacement of Dark Horse by student housing does not serve the student community. While affordable housing is vital, engaging with the local community is also important to us. 
Dark Horse is a place where you find both undergraduate, graduate students, but also non-students. It's a place for everyone. It is a unique place for the people in Boulder, and I would be really sad to see it go. I'm an international, sorry, I'm an international student, and I know a lot of us don't go out as much as American students. I'm guessing because we might not have the same budget. Yet, we are far from our family, and we need to make friends to connect with the community. Dark Horse is a place to do so. It is close to campus for those who don't have a car, and it is affordable. How many other places do you know in Boulder where you can get a burger and a beer for under $10? Mm -hmm. Please keep this place alive. Please keep it affordable. And I believe it is important for students, and it's important for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Havel, either Havel, Big, Biggie, or Harrell. Harrell. Oh, and I, I'm sorry, I should ask each of you to actually introduce yourselves when you, before you speak. Sure. My name is Harrell Biggie. Um, I'm also a grad student at CU, and I live um, around uh, 30th in Colorado. And I kind of want to voice my concerns about Dark Horse and the kind of affordability of housing. Um, Affordability, is, as we know, is a huge problem in Boulder, and I'm a little concerned that most of the housing that's gone up has ultimately ended up as these luxury apartments, which as a grad student is never kind of in our budget range. Um, combined with the fact that Dark Horse is kind of the only walkable place to go to a bar in that entire kind of quadrant of town. Um, and without replacing that, there's not really great transportation options to get to anywhere else uh, like downtown Pearl Street is not really that well accessible from like the Williamsville uh, area. So with that in mind, like Dark Horse is the only place that grad students who live in that area can go for a drink and hang out and socialize. And I just don't see how this new proposal kind of enables that, especially um, without like the big gathering space. Uh, the fact that it was said that Dark Horse is not usually full. In my experience, when I usually go with friends in the evenings, it's usually always packed, except for a few select areas there. So. Um, I'd like to voice my concern to kind of save the dark horse. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is um, uh, Michael Grayson. Remember, please introduce yourself and you'll have two minutes. Hi, my name's uh, Dr. Michael Grayson. Um, I've li uh, I work at CU and I make a surprisingly little amount of money. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've lived in this area for seven years. Um, and I've used it, used this commercial area a lot. And to me, what this looks a lot like is the kind of the gentrification of the area I live in. And it looks a lot like the types of things that I wouldn't be able to afford. And the plan proposed doesn't really look like um, anything similar to, I guess, what it currently looks like. But yeah, I'm mostly worried about the... I wouldn't say this is like a cultural center, but you're still when you're if you get rid of these commercial businesses that have existed for 40 years, that's still a large amount of cultural cultural erosion that's occurring in that area. And it's an area I care care about, so I wanted to voice my concern. Thank you, Dr. Grayson. Um, next is uh, Carol Kravchuk. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Good, okay. Uh, my yeah. name is Kirill Kravchuk um, and um, I wanna start with Dark Horse is a historic restaurant and bar built in 1975 and it serves as a non-traditional third space for every age group to sit down and have a good time with their friends and family. It's a melting pot of Boulder, Boulder car culture with visitors ranging from team sports enthusiasts to hardcore outdoor explorers to quiet Boulder resident families. <clears throat> Uh, it is undoubtedly one of the most historical and artistic bars in all of Colorado. Um, you know, I've traveled around the world a good amount and its interior still astounds me with its intricate beauty. Um, regarding the proposal, um, if there exists a solution where Dark Horse is, present, is preserved while the rest of the block is redeveloped, it could be a compromise. However, um, the presented material made it seem like the goal, that goal is an afterthought. And the uh, promise to move Dark Horse as a sort of an appeasement. So I remain skeptical to that solution. I think that Dark Horse utilizes its internal space to the maximum. It's packed even on weekdays. 
<clears throat> moving Dark Horse, modifying its contents, in my view, it's the same as getting rid of it in a sense. Um, another angle of this issue is the height of the proposed buildings. I find it hard to justify modifying the height to 55 feet. <clears throat> what is the point of the standard if we don't follow it? If we keep allowing this, Boulder residents will no, lo no longer enjoy beautiful foothills and flat irons. <clears throat> to summarize, I am pro deconstruction of dilapidated 70s buildings, but I am anti destruction of historical and cultural heritage, and thus Dark Horse. I do not believe that moving Dark Horse will work or maybe not even happen. Uh, and I do think that uh, we should continue following the standard for the height cap. If such compromises can be achieved, this proposal can be justified. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> Um, ben Herman or Herman. Okay. Hi, my name is uh, Ben Herman. So first I'd like to address some of the uh, restaurant space. So the plan calls for only 7,796 square foot space total. I did some calculations, just the building that has Corelli's and Cosmos is approximately 8,250 square foot. This does not include the dark horse restaurant space on the east side of the Sprouts with Moe's Barbecue Dairy Queen or the dining areas in the Broker Inn and the Conoco Station. Additionally, none of it is slated until the final phase of the development. We might be reminded of the promised low-income senior housing that was to be built off of 33rd and Arapaho as a late phase of the uh, <clears throat> luxury academy senior housing. The low-income housing was completely canceled by the developers after the plans were approved and after they started construction of the luxury uh, center. Developers promise concessions but rarely deliver on them. We stand to lose all of the restaurant space in a crucial junction in town if we let the plan proceed as is. Commercial space, primarily a grocery store, is planned for phase two and three. However, converting convert, eh, commercial space to restaurant space in a multi-story building is expensive to do post-construction. Dedicated restaurant space should be guaranteed in the first phase and more of it, and the plot with the dark horse should remain unchanged. According to the plans, the entirety of the student housing building is contained within the dark horse lot and parking lot. This building should be removed or at least reduced to the only in the existing dark horse parking lot. This would reduce the overall number of units and traffic considerations. However, if more units are absolutely required, some of the buildings next to Willville could have be even higher than 55 feet, given that the Darley Towers are 150 feet. However, there are aspects of the, of the plan that are good, such as apartments above a grocery store. That is a great idea. But the Dark Horse serves as a meeting point for the entirety of the south side of town and is walkable within minutes to the highest density of students at Bear Creek, the student apartments along 28th and 30th, and the neighborhoods Baseline, Southern Martin Acres, which are also very high student populations. For a plan that prides itself on increasing walkability, they do not take into account the severe decrease of walkability that the loss of a family-friendly restaurant, bar, and community meeting point would bring to that side of town. Great, thank you. Um, Sage Sherman. All right, hello there, and thank you, members of the planning your name, committee. Your name, please. Oh, hello there. Uh, my name is Dr. Sage Sherman, and I'm a postdoctoral associate at CU Boulder. I want to thank you for having uh, us be able to voice our concerns during this meeting. Um, one of the things that I want to mention is we bring up a lot of um, concerns and compliments about the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. However, I want to bring up maybe some of the goals and objectives of the Boulder County Sustainability Plan and whether or not we meet the objectives of that plan and Boulder's assessment of trying to reach carbon neutrality. The ambitious development of new projects obviously can create um, more uh, problems and issues when it comes to trying to address some of those concerns. And one of those concerns that I could potentially point toward to is the deconstruction and dissolution of Sprouts Farmers Market, which can be a resource that helps chapter five of supporting local food and agriculture, where Sprouts Market actually gets many of its food and produce items from local Colorado farmers. And I have skeptic, I'm a little skeptical about the retail spaces and the commercial areas that are going to move into the area and whether or not they're going to actually be able to meet some of the objectives that are outlined by the Boulder County Sustainability Plan. And so uh, I just want to keep it a little bit briefer, but I think that greater consideration and more due diligence into future planning for whatever this zoning project would be would uh, keep the sustainability plan in greater detail. Thank you very much. Uh, Matthew Jensen.
Thank you very much. Matthew Jensen, from Boulder High School graduate and a Boulder Chamber ambassador and a graduate of Leadership Fellows Program of the Community Foundation. Um, I believe that our task here is to keep Boulder weird, keep <laughs> it unique, keep it special, and keep it with that special identity that I grew up with and that we all remember. Change is inevitable. Um, I think it's important that we embrace change, that we accept it, and that as community leaders, um, that we adapt to those community needs. Um, initially, I was here to just talk about the dark horse and I wanted to save the dark horse. So many amazing memories there. But after seeing this plan, I have some serious concerns in other areas. So much of this community has already changed. It's been homogenized. Um, the character has been removed from it. Um, it. It just doesn't feel different. It doesn't feel the same as it did as the boulder that I, that I knew that I grew up in. Um, some serious concerns about no parking there. If you've driven there now with the amount of uh, housing that there currently exists, it, it, it's awful to drive there. I couldn't even imagine going to a basketball game or a football game and having to deal with that. And if you think that a, a, an adjunct professor is going to live there, I think we're, we're out of our mind. I think the people that are going to end up living there are rich kids that their parents from California or Texas buy them properties there. Um, uh, I think you mentioned that the businesses are struggling there. It is hard to start and keep a business going in this community. Those businesses have been there for over 20 years and they are still and continue to thrive. I would ask that the city uh, highly uh, recommend that the applicant give some sort of historical designation to the, to the dark horse. We have to keep Boulder weird. We have to keep it funky have to keep with the character. The yuppification of Boulder needs to stop. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, next is uh, Gregory Katz. Kate's, sorry. <laughs> I'd first like to say the applicant clearly hey, cares. Your name, please. Sorry, your right, name. Sorry. Name's Gregory Kate's. First, like to say the applicant clearly cares about Boulder, Andy. Uh, but you say that Dark Horse can't pay their rent, but you want to put in commercial housing that's going to be less affordable? Doesn't make any sense. Sorry. Boulder is an incredible place where people from all walks of life, diverse people can come together and experience a weird artistic town that loves just opening its community. And it, the reason it's so colorful and has so much personality is because of its local businesses. The Dark Horse has been here for decades and it is one of the pillars in that colorful personnel. You, it, it cannot be taken down and it has to be preserved historically. I have many concerns about moving it to a more commercialized space. Uh, it's not the same building. It doesn't have the same character. And this is a 70s mall, and I think we all want affordable housing, but I don't think this is affordable. I don't see it as affordable. I think who's going to live there with uh, at least estimations for other buildings the Williams family has around 1800 a month. Mm. It's going to be rich kids. It's going to be no adjunct professors. It's going to be luxury apartments, which is something the Boulder does not need. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um... Hunter Domani. Domian, that was pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> Please just remember to introduce yourself. Um, my name is Hunter Damiani. Um, I have been living in Boulder for about 20 years, and I've been living in Martin Acres for about 12. Um, so this is my community. Um, and we all love the Dark Horse. I've been going there for 20 years along with the Williams family. And realistically, I mean, if it wasn't for them, it still wouldn't be open. Um, so they love that place just as much as we all do. And I know they wanna see it continue in a new place where it can flourish. Um, but uh, realistically, as a community in Boulder, we have a huge problem. Like in Martin Acres, my neighborhood is uh, a lot of people living together that can't afford housing. Um, right behind me, there is uh, 12 people living in one house in a co-op because 
we need more housing in Boulder. Um, this is been a problem here for a long time. And um, this area is, it's just a parking lot. It, it needs to be updated. There's, I, I've walked through it a bunch of times. I ride my bike through there all the time. My girlfriend and I both shop at Sprouts, but it's a lot of unused space that could really be updated. When you're driving into Boulder, this is the first thing you're coming into. And even those pictures that were brought up um, showing the space and showing the retaining wall, there were police in the parking lot. I mean, that is a common thing there because it is not a properly used space. And I think this is a great opportunity for a really wonderful family to do an amazing thing with the space that has needed an update for a long time. And um, there's already massive buildings right there. If you look, there's Spanish towers across from 27th. There's also multiple story apartments. It's not really going outside of what already exists. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Um, Adam Perry. Adam Perry. All right. Second. Let them know who's up. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, that, uh, all right. Um, Aiden Young's. Aiden Young. I cannot pronounce your last name. And after Aiden, Aiden, it will be Kurt Dagaford. Dag. Close. Close. Okay. <laughs> get my, my notes here. My name is Aiden Young's Gudis. Uh, I'm a Denver and Boulder native. I am here today to earnestly plead against the proposed plan for Williams Village 2. Not only are the proposed Williams Village plans completely exploitative of their student demographic, it supposedly accommodates within, I mean, as we all know, very unaffordable $2,000 plus monthly price tag, which typically goes with housing in Boulder, well beyond any student's reasonable price range. But the plan also proposes tearing down longstanding pillars of the community that provide invaluable services to the Boulder community, including grocery stores, restaurants, and most specifically, the world famous Dark Horse. <laughs> Aside from being the only bar in Boulder worth a damn, the Dark Horse has been a cornerstone of the city for decades and is one of the few remaining icons reminding the city of its original draw of creativity and community. It serves all corners of the community, from being a college hotspot to a family restaurant, to sports bar to cultural landmark. I have known people to come back to Boulder after decades just to visit the Dark Horse. I have seen long lost friends and family members reunited. And on more than one occasion, I've witnessed people make their first friend there after moving into town. These are the things that matter in a community that I believe as representatives of the city of Boulder, you must take into consideration. The fact is that Dark Horse does more for the community and student population of Boulder than exploitative student housing ever could. It's called world famous because of its immense reputation and to tear it down would be a travesty to the community and the world at large. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, Kurt. And then after Kurt is David, Daniel Henderson. My name is Kurt Dagaford, and I'm here to voice my objection to the development proposal that would demolish or relocate the Dark Horse in favor of new development. I'm a local. I've been coming to the Dark Horse since I was a student in high school. I attended CU Boulder and made many, many memories within its walls. And although I have since moved out of the city, I still regularly visit Boulder to patronize the Dark Horse. My story is not unique. The Dark Horse is more than just a restaurant and bar, more than just an old building. It is a community. For me and many others, the Dark Horse holds a special place in our hearts. Is it a place for families and friends to gather? A place to celebrate life's highs and commiserate its lows? A place that is welcoming and accessible to all, regardless of wealth, skin color, religion, or creed? It is one of the few remaining and affordable establishments left in Boulder. While much of the city has been redeveloped to cater to a wealthier and upscale clientele, the Dark Horse has remained a pillar of the community, a place for everyone. I understand the desire to modernize and revitalize the location and do not object to this in concept, but newer is not always better and it is critically important to consider the impact of new development, especially as it impacts a well-loved and long-standing pillar of the community. Demolishing the dark horse would represent an incredible loss. It is irreplaceable. It is historic. Relocating the dark horse is also problematic. The building, as it stands today and how it has stood for decades, has a life of its own, a soul. Moving, 
Moving it would remove the very essence of what makes it special. I also worry about a bait and switch in which the original intent to relocate the Dark Horse is abandoned entirely in favor of something else. There's a well-known history of broken promises in Boulder development. I implore the board to reject this development proposal. Let the Dark Horse stay. Thank you for my time. Thank you. All right, David Henderson, and next will be Chad Henderson. Good evening, uh, Daniel Henderson. Sorry, Daniel. Uh, no problem. Um, I'm a Boulder native. I graduated from CU twice. I left and came back like so many of us do. Um, I consider myself a Philly well-off resident in Boulder and Dark Horse is and has been and will be my favorite restaurant. Um, you all know it's a special place. Uh, my wife and I took our wedding photos there. <laughs> uh, so I won't speak too much on that. I think that if we've heard a theme uh, tonight, it's that affordability is sort of the word uh, that goes around. And I'm sure I don't come to these meetings a lot, but that it's a citywide problem. I saw you nod uh, when an earlier person said Dark Horse is the last person to get a burger and a beer for $10. Um, that remains true. Uh, I heard a really great melting pot type reference here that this is a place where everybody from students to grad students to families to um, more well-off individuals can come and do. Um, and I worry that with the proposed development that that will change. Um, I think that the applicant represented themselves really well with, uh, as far as being well-meaning. Um, and I'd like to hear a plan for how can the affordability of this area be preserved because I think there is a lot to be said for cramming a lot of cheap um, money earning space into this uh, little spot. Um, it's, it's not a destination for a lot of people. As we said, there's cars and parking lots that you have to intend to come here. Um, so, uh, I think in general, I'm in favor of trying to find a way to maybe focus the proposal on the broker area as not the phase three, but maybe the phase one. All right, thank you. Um, Chad Henderson, and then uh, Louis, Louis LaCroix. Hello, my name is Chad Henderson. Uh, to start, I've been angry about the development of Boulder since about 2012. <laughs> I was born and raised here. The hospital I was born is gone, or rather moved, and the building has been empty and derelict since. The University Hill has been practically gutted well before the hotels were designed to replace it, and there's really not a space left in this town, as we've been saying, is affordable and accessible. It's fantastic to try to develop more housing, to put more places in this town for people to afford to live, but it's not gonna be how it works. I even keep hearing student housing for this proposal. Student housing is itself unaffordable in this town. I spent several hours today trying to look for an apartment that I could afford that's less than $2,200, and I still can't really find that, mm -hmm. let alone with the access that I need in space, the access to windows, the access to my job, which I've worked at for almost 10 years, I still barely make enough to uh, put myself outside of affordable housing AMR or AMI for this town. So I'm in a dead zone in so far as I'm too wealthy to get housing help here and I'm far too poor to afford the housing to be here. This plan I don't think will address any of that. I think adding a thousand people to an already horribly done intersection won't work. We all know the issues with Colorado and 30th just north of it regardless of the fact that an intersection has uh, been updated there. I've still almost been hit multiple times by cars and bikes alike from that development. This town has long since had great aspirations for the re development that it can do and failed to achieve it often by not listening to the residents and their concerns. On top of that, of course, we all want the dark horse itself to say, as everyone has so aptly said here, and especially that should be taken into account, clearly the international recognition that it is getting, not just from people like my brother and I that are born and raised in the neighborhood and would love to keep doing, going there and experiencing it for as long as we stay in this town. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lois LaCroix, and then it'll be Anna Malara Whitman. Lois LaCroix, I've lived in Boulder since 1970. I helped decorate the Dark Horse. It is a great bar. 
Um, this building is way, way too massive for the spot. It's a BC2 and an MUB zoning, and they're asking for four and five height, four and five levels of a height, and they're talking about Stearns and Darley. They were not even subject to the city height limit. That has nothing to do with how high that those buildings should be. They have said in their proposal that they're going to pay cash in lieu, which is a stupid position that the city has anyway, and that they are not going to be affordable housing units there. And how much ever the Williams family may be a lovely family, they're not doing this for the good of the city of Boulder. They're doing it to make money. They're gonna make a lot of money. There are no affordable units that are gonna be there. The, hot, the biggest apartment that they're talking about is 791 square feet. There is no way a family could ever live in there. It's, it's ridiculous. And then on top of that, the 30th and baseline intersection, there's only two ways out of that, that whole um, property. Baseline intersection is one of the most dangerous intersections right now for bicycles and pedestrians. There are more accidents there than almost any other intersection in the city of Boulder. There's an intersection at 28th and baseline, one at 30th and baseline, and you're talking about putting another one on baseline. It, 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 the traffic concept is, it will not work. Um, hiding, uh, what did you say something? You said something about making hidden parking. How are, how are people gonna go to commercial businesses if the parking, parking is hidden? I, it, it's a terrible, massive place that does not belong in BC2 housing area. Thank you very much. Um, Anna, Mal Anna Malara Whitman. And then, and then it'll be Jerob Felknor. I think I'm mispronouncing that. Hello, my name is Anna Malara Whitman and I'm here to echo and speak on the importance of trying to keep the dark horse. Um, now, I do apologize, seeing as I don't know the plan or layout very well, but uh, myself and many of my friends, some of which are with me today, uh, echo uh, the same sentiment, sentiment. I have seen the shift in Boulder's culture. I've lived in Boulder my whole life, and every year I see that more gentrification is occurring that has subsequently led to the destruction of Boulder hallmarks, such as the beloved Sturz and Copeland that we lost a couple years ago. Um, removing those hallmarks takes away part of what it means to be a citizen, student, or tourist resident in Boulder. The dark horse is one of those staples. Um, the unique environment, the impressive decor, and antiques that hang in the dark horse is what drew many of us in. It is one of the last remaining things in Boulder that makes me feel like kind of how it was when I was growing up. Um, as a younger person, I can absolutely sympathize with the fact that we do need affordable housing in this city and in this town. Um, Absolutely. However, we are demolishing a huge part of the community uh, by getting rid of the dark horse and other surrounding businesses, which are equally not are, are equally important. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Jerob Felknor and then Adam Caro, I think, is next. Um, Jacob Felknor. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you guys for uh, giving all of us the opportunity to speak today. Um, I won't belabor the point much more. My, uh, you know, all people here have really hit at home about what the dark horse means to this community. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of talk about my personal experience with it. Um, I'm a third generation CU Boulder grad. Uh, my grandparents moved here as graduate students in uh, um, the late fifties, actually. Uh, I, early 60s, they bought a house. Um, affordability of housing is obviously a problem in Boulder. Um, and, you know, uh, I also believe that this, this proposal will turn more into luxury apartments as opposed to affordable housing. Um, going back to the dark horse, my dad worked there when he was a student at CU. Um, he went off and became an accountant and then returned to the dark horse as he revented his school to become a teacher in his mm. community. Um, this place has, uh, has, has been a third place for you know, members of this community. Uh, for me, I have my home, my work, and the dark horse in Boulder. Um, I want to continue to echo the, you know, 
the, the sentiment from everyone uh, that we need to keep Boulder weird. We need to keep Boulder, Boulder's character. The Dark Horse is that place for me and so many other people. Um, there are countless, countless occasions that I've, I've gone to the Dark Horse for, you know, from sporting events to celebrating birthdays to celebrating new jobs. Um, you know, this, this place is home. Um, the final thing I'll say is I urge you guys to consider who showed up tonight. Um, you know, I, I think, I think part of your responsibility is to reflect the, uh, you know, the best wishes of, of the community you serve. And, uh, I mean, I think I've counted one, maybe objection from the community tonight. Uh, I know we haven't gotten to everybody, but I urge you to please reflect the wishes of the community who showed up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Adam L Laro, Adam 805 20th. Okay. Uh, my name is Adam Garb. I am here today just as a community member. I've only been in Boulder for five years. I'm an undergrad student at CU. Um, I just kind of wanted to share my uh, experience when I bring people to Boulder, um, people who are here to see me or see my friends, um, like my family, past friends from you know, where else I've lived. Um, they never peek the hill on 36 and see Boulder for the first time and say, wow, look at Willville. Um, it's, it's never the first thought in their mind. So adding more of Willville, um, I, I don't see as a benefit to the community because it, it detracts from the mountains and the view and the culture that we have here. Um, I, I, when I bring this up to my friends uh, in classes and at work, um, no, one, no one's excited. Um, no one's like, thank God the dark horse is going away. It, it, it is not reflected well in the community. And a lot of people haven't heard about this, but I mean, there are, there are a lot of people here. I don't, I don't know what your turnout is normally, but this seems pretty large. Um, so I, th I think that speaks volumes. And I, I just, I, I feel like a lot of the community and people that I talk to and deal with, which are students, which make up a majority of the community, um, don't feel positively about this. It's rather a heartbreaking conversation to have. that We are at this point in city planning where we are thinking about tearing down the dark horse and adding more Willville, which no one is generally happy to see when they look at Boulder first time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Lu Luisa or Luis, Luisa Elnsor. And then, thank you. And then next will be uh, Paul Whiteside. Uh, hello, my name is Luisa Ensor, and I'm a first year student at CU Boulder. Um, I'm studying engineering in the engineering honors program and I live in Willville currently. Um, along with many other people here, I do not want the, the restaurant to be demolished. My mother and I went there from when I've, when I've just been born. Um, it's a place where people gather. It's a place where people um, come together and learn more about each other. And I think tearing it down is something that's, you're, you're just gonna lose the community there and people are gonna eventually have to move because of that. But in the event that this doesn't go through and we instead said build some things sorry i'm really nervous um <laughs> don't be you're doing fine i i come to the conclusion that there are some safety concerns as a student who um lives in student housing currently i notice on the plan that there are rooftops on student housing and I, that is an issue right now um all rooftops in cu boulder are closed due to the event that students, unfortunately, have been throwing themselves off rooftops. So then I question, where are you sending these students to you know, do outdoor activities? Are you sending them back to the original Williams Village? Um, along with that, where are students who have meal plans going to go? Are they, again, those 800 students or however many we were talking, where are they going to go get their meals? Where, where are they gonna go? And one other concern I noticed was everybody was saying, um, going through the parking lot is, um, unsafe. And while I do agree with that, the main concern here is that there are unfortunately many um, homeless people and people that like to, you know, take advantage of students walking home, especially in the night. And I question with all the benches I see in the proposed plan, um, what are we going to do for safety of students trying to get back to their dorms or their student housing? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Paul Whiteside. And Paul White who will be followed by Thomas Sigler. Please go ahead. Sorry. 
this is a really kind of an interesting situation that the family and the developers are in with the dark horse. This business has been struggling really for quite a long time. The owner is 70 years old and is in a position that they are going to have a difficult time trying to transition this to a new, to a new, um, uh, to a new group of people that may be related to them. There are certain financial realities here that are greatly affecting the situation. This is something that the, the family would love to be able to try to continue. Uh, but the, the ownership at this point, we've got an agreement with them and um, it's been had long conversations with them. They are right now trying to figure out how they will sustain this company and this, this business and this restaurant going forward themselves. There's quite a bit of value in all of the interior improvements there and that those improvements could very well help um, is, is the intention is that those may be sold in order to help the family um, going forward um, and, um, you know, and help their legacy. But at this point in time, there are large challenges. We don't want anybody to get the wrong impression here that this is something that can easily be transited straight into another property that will be developed on the, on the premises. So there are challenges here. We want everybody to know that and that the uh, Tobins couldn't be here tonight to discuss this themselves, but it is their intention to try to transition potentially out of this business at some point in their future. Um, we wanna keep it along for around now another um, two, three, four years potentially, uh, if we can keep going and so continue to subsidize the business. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, Sir, can I, I just wanna ask, um, what is your relationship to the Wild I'm, Irish or? I am assisting the, the development team. I am part of the development team. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking. Okay, uh, Thomas Sigler, Sigler, and then uh, Destin Woods. Hello, I'm Thomas Sigler. Um, I live off of 30th and Colorado currently. And um, I want to speak mostly on the fact that Dark Horse is a great place to get food and is one of the few places nearby that I can get food that's not just a low wage, quick access, like honestly, fairly subpar, um, mini chain sort of place to get food. Um, there's also the barbecue place that is in that corner and also Giono's, which is the Italian place. Those are also very good places to get food that is not a $10 hastily made under a warmer sort of fast food uh, items. Uh, these having a variety of places to eat and ways to eat are very important places. Um, I really enjoy being able to sit down and eat at a place and not just be shuffled out so that some other person can come in and get a, as previously stated, a hastily slapped together sandwich. Um, also in that shopping center is Game Force, which is a very important place for digital archiving and keeping uh, our digital history alive and safe and well. They do a lot of work on uh uh, refurbishing and making available older forms of electronics for future generations to continue to enjoy. Um, much of our digital history is being lost actively because people are not taking time to preserve it and keep it safe. And we need to be preserving our digital and physical histories equally so that we can keep those items alive for future generations to build off of and to enjoy also. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Destin Woods. And after Destin, we'll be going to folks who are online. And at that point, um, uh, Amanda will be, someone will be taking over from calling names. Uh, go ahead, please, Destin. Hi, uh, my name is Destin Woods. Uh, I work as a robotics technician uh, for CU. Um, and I would also like to echo my sentiment for the dark horse, but also, uh, the unique architecture based on a quick Google search will not fit with anything in the architectural portfolio of Morgan Creek ventures or Coburn. I actually have some friends that live, uh, at timber apartments, which is by 
some office building that they designed that was originally supposed to be a new Twitter headquarters, now X and Elon Musk, all that jazz. Um, and I know for a fact that those apartments are not nearly affordable. Uh, a studio, mind you, that is maybe 650 square feet is 1800 a month at my current salary. The max I could afford is like 1352. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they think that this is going to be affordable housing with the architecture that they have planned is a ridiculous idea. And not to mention who is going to manage said architecture or said building as well in terms of leasing and uh, such. I also used to work for, let's say the boogeyman four star realty um, if we want to say, uh, exploiting students for housing costs and everything, like who's going to manage that? Are we going to give it over to them? Are we going to give it over to Boulder property management as well? Who has many houses that are barely up to code. Um, so I would like to know what the plan is for affordable housing within such luxurious architecture, not to mention trying to even move the dark horse into something like that, which will also now bump up their prices as well. I just don't see any kind of affordability in this plan, um, as well as the the sentiment of moving the students over here versus having a bunch of resident housing in the middle and then students over here. Why would you not put the students next to the students where there's already a buff bus line where they would like to go and use and take to campus? I, I fail to see how that is a good plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, Thomas and Amanda, please take over from here. Yeah, thank you. We're actually going to have Vivian um, help us, <clears throat> excuse me, on Zoom. Vivian? Yeah, so, so far we have 11 um, members from the public online who have their hands raised. Just want to ask others who plan to speak to go ahead and uh, raise their hand as well. So we have a good idea of the numbers. And I'll introduce people in order that I see and let you know who's next so you can get ready. And remember, you have two minutes. Um, I will call on you, but please also introduce yourself. So we'll start with Kimmen Harmon, followed by M. Fox. Please go ahead, Kimmen. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Kimmen Harmon, and you can hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. good. Um, so, um, I just want to say that you, in all of their presentation, um, totally ignored um, the entire um, Martin Acres development, which the Williams family um, developed. Um, we are reliant on that center um, because we have no grocery store left in Basemar. Um, we will become a food desert when Sprouts goes away. Uh, we walk from Martin Acres over there. There are a whole bunch of people, more than students, that use that, and you are totally neglecting a huge population of, of people. Um, it, it's obvious it's just completely student-centered, and it's it's not a reality. Martin Acres is full of families and pe people who work, um, as well as students that need that center. So anyway, I just wanted to talk to that. I also want to talk about on um, page 224 um, on some of your staff comments that's saying based on the metrics provided, um, I'm saying that the concept review application, which you note contains several inconsistencies um, and the current proposal is primarily a residential project. Such a percentage breakdown is arguably inconsistent with the intent of both the CB and the MUB land use designations and clearly inconsistent with the desired characterizations of neighborhood centers as outlined in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And then on page 177 regarding use, such a percentage breakdown is arguably inconsistent with the intent of both the CB and the MUB land use designation and is clearly inconsistent with the desired characteristics of neighborhood centers as outlined in Boulder Valley Comprehension Plan. And I'm also dismayed by the zero on-site affordable housing. I understand the rationale of cash in lieu, leveraging collected money with additional grants, et cetera, but the foundational concept of inclusionary housing is exactly that, affordable housing included in developments alongside market rate units. Thank you, by, Kevin. Okay. Please, please wrap it up with a final thought. Uh, my final thought is by always shipping off affordable units elsewhere, Boulder actually practices exclusionary zoning. Thank you. Thank you. So next up we have M. Fox followed by George Kraft. Please go ahead, M, and introduce yourself with your first and last name. 
Hi, my name is M. Fox, and I spent a couple years living at the Kensington apartment building right across Baseline. Uh, despite it being said earlier that you can only access the Dark Horse and the other businesses there by car, that was one of my favorite walks in all of uh, Boulder. Uh, the Dark Horse is an iconic part of Boulder, and as stated, it's eligible to be a historic landmark this year, and it holds a significant meaning for Boulder residents past and present. On the other hand, the proposed plans lack personality and will further destroy what little history and character Boulder has left. Moving forward with these plans will leave the neighborhood a bland, cookie-cutter, luxury housing nothingness that will not fulfill the needs or capture the hearts of Boulder residents the way that the places like the Dark Horse can. Uh, I was paying about $1,400 for uh, a one-bedroom apartment at Kensington, and there's no way that those units aren't going to be even more expensive than that. Um, as stated earlier, there are thousands of people who walk through the, the uh, Dark Horse development area daily, and to them, it is a place of community building. The deep meaning that that place holds to the community will not be the same if you tear down the historic building that has become so iconic, and its relocation cannot even be guaranteed. This would be a major loss to Boulder's identity as a city. This is not even to mention ruining even more views in the area by allowing a building height increase. This proposal suggests changing so many rules to make it happen, and it's not for the benefit of the people of Boulder. Thank you very much. Thank you, Em. Next, we have George Kraft, followed by David Pardo. Please go ahead, George. Hi, my name is George Kraft. I live in Baseline Sub. I've lived here for over 40 years. I don't represent any organization, just my family and me. I think the Williams Village development uh, is a terrible idea for several reasons, including the impact on neighborhood, <clears throat> crime, parking, traffic, flood control, and the merchants. Um, Baseline Sub is an um, area of single family homes occupied by families and students. When Villeville East was built, it was a significant impact on the neighborhood. Traffic surged, crime increased. Parking became a nightmare because parking at the new buildings was inadequate and too expensive for the students. The whole tenor of the neighborhood changed. The placement of another development of high density dwellings across from this neighborhood will exacerbate the problem. Despite having parking on site, it is likely to encourage the same problems that currently exist. Traffic will also be a problem. Baseline Road is already very busy. 30th Street to the south of Baseline is busy with bus, resident, and commercial traffic. <clears throat> There's simply no way to safely and conveniently move hundreds of residents, um, 855 students. How many cars is that? <clears throat> There's really no way to get that traffic in and out of that corner. I'm not a hydrological engineer, but I don't think I have to be one to realize the floodplain diagram is wishful thinking. Anyone who was here in 2013 realizes that Bear Creek and Skunk Creek are disasters waiting to happen. Placing a series of hard buildings in the floodplain is just a bad idea. And I notice there's a high hazard area as well. <clears throat> the people in our neighborhood, others nearby and their students appreciate a summer's night treat at Dairy Queen, a fine dinner at Corelli's, a great sandwich at Moe's, a pizza at, at Cosmo's, or getting their food from Sprouts. And of course, the dark horse. There's Thank no you. substitute. George, you just, you've come to the end of the two minutes. You could just wrap up. I'll just to finish. So I'm saying, I really think it's a mistake to allow this development. It'll present danger and traffic, flood control. It will change a quiet and peaceful neighborhood into a nightmare like 30th and Pearl and other commercial areas. Okay. Thank you, George. Sorry to cut you off, but I just want to be there. Everybody else. Thank you for being here. Um, next, we have David Pardo, followed by Scott Witter. Please go ahead, David, and please introduce yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Pardo, and I first moved to Boulder in 2012. I actually worked two jobs um, to make rent at the time, which was a laughably small $650 a month for my room with five roommates in a house. Um, but I worked at the 
Whole Foods at 29th and Pearl and during the day stocking the produce department. And then at night, I would go bartend at Rubens, which has since closed, but many folks remember it for its great Belgian beer selection. I eventually had to leave Boulder because I couldn't afford to live there anymore. There wasn't enough housing and I was getting old enough that I didn't want to live in a house with four roommates. That was something that I didn't want to do anymore. So I moved down to Denver and that's actually where I'm calling you in from. I make it up to Boulder all the time. I love visiting the Dark Horse. But the reality is that I was forced out of Boulder as were most of my friends who I made when I first arrived in Boulder because there was not enough housing in Boulder. Housing prices went up massively every single year. My friends who bought a house for half a million dollars in 2014, their house is now worth 1.25 million. They could never afford to buy their house. The most important thing that Boulder needs is more housing. And so any way that can happen is incredibly valuable. I've always dreamed of being able to move back to Boulder. And the idea of there being new housing units sounds awesome to me. Whether the dark horse will be the same if it moves, should maybe the plan be changed to allow the existing dark horse to stay, that's up for debate. But to me, the housing element while retaining all that business that's already there would be incredible. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Thank you for sticking to the time. Um, next, we have Scott Woodard, followed by Mike Marsh. Please go ahead, Scott. You've done mute yourself. Hello? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Okay, great. Hey, I'm Scott Woodard. I'm the managing partner of Fit Properties that owns the Sprouts building. I've been a Boulder resident since 1975. I actually worked in the gas station on the corner of the summer in 1976 when the Albertsons was where Sprouts is now. Uh, in 1985, we purchased that building. It was wheels roller rink. Uh, we turned it into Pulse Fitness Center, uh, Boulder's Coast nightclub, the first Boulder Rock Club, 24-hour fitness was in there for 10 years. Sprouts has been there for 15 years. Uh, I'm a developer in town. I've been discussing redeveloping this project with the Williams family for almost 35 years. And it's a very complicated project with a lot of moving pieces. And I think this team has the skills and experience to be able to handle those issues. Right now, we have a lot of safety issues on the property. We have numerous pedestrian and auto uh, conflicts. The north side of Sprouts is constantly an icing problem in the winter because the roof drains across the driveway and we have drainage problems throughout the entire site. It's an old inefficient design with rundown buildings and obviously mostly uh, impermeable surfaces for parking. This plan I think is one of the best uses for this site and the location for multifamily couldn't be better anywhere else. I think I'm excited about this team and their proposal for Williams Village too. I hope you can help them along with their project and guide them to a successful uh, conclusion. Uh, thanks for your time tonight. Thank you, Scott. Next, we have Mike Marsh followed by Paula Mosley. Uh, please go ahead, Mike. Good evening. I wish more board members lived in this area so they would know the lived day to day as we do. Currently westbound baseline traffic at rush hour stopped at the 28th street light already backs up past 29th and 30th streets at rush hours. The 28th street intersection handles tons of in and out commuter traffic because that's where they get on and off the highway plus local neighborhood traffic. If you add a traffic light at 29th street, feeding even more cars into this mess, you'll have multi-directional backups on top of backups. I can send photos of the baseline backups to you. I'm hearing lots of nice, but non-binding and probably empty promises from the developers. I urge the board to require the zoning prescribed retail, moving the dark course, et cetera, in phase one, and then allow the unusual exception uses of housing and hotel in later phases. Neighborhoods serving benefits are all in phase three. 
Developers make the least money on retail and they'll drop it like a hot potato. We've seen over and over this stuff gets dropped in the final phases and you'll have no recourse then. This is land zoned as retail. Last, we can't sleep with our windows open in summer because of the adjacent deafening Highway 36 noise at 75 miles per hour and we don't have air conditioning. The World Health Organization ranks traffic noise second among environmental threats to public health after air pollution. Currently, half the highway noise disperses north towards Fraser Meadows, but now you're considering 55-foot high hard surface buildings on the north side of US 36 towering above the highway that will reflect the sound directly back to Martin Acres to the south. Its basic acoustics will get a double dose of already deafening highway noise is the city's goal to destroy Martin Acres? If not, please limit these buildings to the height of the elevated highway and no higher. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next up, we have Paula Mosley, followed by Ron DePew. Hi, I'm Paula Mosley. I live in Martin Acres as well. Um, sorry, get my notes. Uh oh, I thought there were going to be more speakers. The community, this was mentioned over and over this evening. However, it appears that this refers to a whole new community, one that prioritizes is the new residents and disregards the existing neighborhoods that are supported by our existing retail center. Preserve existing? If the entire site is to be demolished, that does not sound like preserving. It sounds like replacing and substituting with an inward focus, rather than the way that the current retail and services support existing neighborhoods. Calling the current center a strip mall is a bit insulting. It was, that was in some of the documentation. Um, it's not what you see on Wadsworth, you know, where you've got pawn shops and tattoo parlors and stuff. Our Williams Village doesn't meet the stereotype of a strip mall. Is it in need of beautification? Yes. In need of a facelift? Yes. Updating? Yes. Green areas? Yes. Shade trees? Yes. Any decent designer or architect can create something good from a cleared, demolished site but a great design team can build something good that works with and honors what already exists. I also question the notion that pushing retail right up to the street makes it more inviting. Looking at Baseline Crossing, for example, the only folks I see out front of those businesses are people waiting for the bus. People don't wanna eat lunch outdoors a few feet from Baseline or any other busy road. I do not support changing the zoning or allowing modifications to the height limits. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Next up, we have Ron DePue followed by Daniel Howard. Please go ahead, Ron. You have to unmute yourself, Ron. Sorry. Hi, I'm Ron DePew. I've lived in Martin Acres for over 40 years. 2952 baseline is zone BC2, defined by code section 9.5.2 as neighborhood serving retail, serving a number of neighborhoods. Staff note the current site complies with that code requirement. What is proposed won't. Just 8% will be retail, for 80% will be extremely high density, unaffordable housing, and 66% a hotel. Page 173 of your packet says that hotels are not an allowed use in BT, BC2 zoning, allotting just 8% of the property for neighborhood serving retail and zoning that city law says should be all or nearly all re retail is not compliant with the zoning per chapter nine. Second, the meager, the retail is slated for the very last phase of the development. Final phases of a project is where items tend to get dropped. We regularly see developers claim the project went over budget and final phase retail just won't pencil. Uh, note the developer's words, the current retail and restaurant uses will be retained when possible. When possible is a loose phrase telegraphing that it won't happen. 
The developer of the former Daily Camera building in 11th and Pearl, for instance, promised a community theater in order to get the project approved, but never actually built the theater. Uh, 311 Mapleton developer promised offsite affordable housing at the former Fruhoff's Flowers site. That never happened either. 8% retail is way too little, and the developer will probably drop even that small bit in the final phase. I expect that Sprouts will be dropped rather than relocated. What's clear from the examples I cite is that the city doesn't have any way of uh, enforcing promises that developers make in order to get their permits. Please deny this proposal or require at least 50% retail, restaurants and services in phase one, two and three, since those are the purposes of this property per code section nine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just letting everyone know we have five more people waiting to speak. If you haven't raised your hand yet, uh, please do so, so that we know to call on you. So next up we have Daniel Howard, followed by Lisa Harris. Please go ahead, Daniel. Uh, yes, my name is Daniel Howard. I live in South Boulder. I would like to voice my support for the development. As a regular bike commuter along 36, the current excess of impervious surface asphalt for car parking is inherently unfriendly and hostile towards bikers and fellow pedestrians. The current design addresses this and creates a much friendlier destination. Reminds me of my own living quarters in college is in a mixed-use setting where I had too much ice cream from the shops below my apartment and my mixed-use residential address. This mixed-use proposal provides improved walkability and clearly aligns with the current Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Nonetheless, my primary feedback for developers involves parking intensity. I wholly support the intention of a re request of a parking reduction requirement, particularly to reduce car dependency. To fully realize this alongside ideally affordable housing, I would encourage the cost of the very expensive underground parking which can be $20,000 to $50,000 per spot, be decoupled from any rental housing costs. If a resident chooses to be car independent, they should not have to pay for car parking bundled into a vent. Our parking should be charged separate from rent, and when formulating the specific parking supply to provide, this economic nuance should be considered when finalizing the built parking design and associated request for parking reduction. All in all, I remain excited for Dark Horse 2.0 with an amphitheater. The Dark Horse was the first establishment I visited this evening I first arrived in Boulder. However, the experience was soured by the current excessive parking provider that promotes drunk driving. I would be excited to be a potential future resident in one of these multifamily units. This way, as a person who chooses to live car free, I will gain the freedom to walk less than a thousand feet to both a grocery store and an iconic third place institution of Dark Horse, among many other community centric meeting places within the proposed development. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Daniel. Next, we have Lisa Harris, followed by Cecilia Gears. Please go ahead, Lisa. Hi, my name is Lisa Harris. I'm a Boulder Community Hospital baby, and I am a lifetime resident. I live in Martin Acres and with many of my neighbors, along with the thousands of students that live in Willville and the Bear Creek Apartments. We shop at those stores. I realize that high end maximum density housing creates maximum developer profits, but 2952 baselines, zoning code and comp plan neighborhood center designations are quite clear. This site is for neighborhood serving retail, which allows residents to walk and bike more and drive less. We want to support the city's climate action goals. Help us help you. But this project takes us in the opposite direction, driving ever farther distances for everyday needs. South Boulder has very limited shopping and this project removes even more of it. Why do reasonable resident needs for basic necessary walkable retail always take a backseat to developer profits? Online purchasing doesn't fulfill all needs, nor should it. It doesn't support local businesses, nor should it. We, we need to support our local businesses. We need to make room for local retail. And it creates, this creates longer consumer pipe, tailpipes. The comp plan directs neighborhood centers to have quote, buildings at scale and intensity lower than downtown. Downtown's height limit is 38 feet. 2952 baseline proposes a solid wall of 655 foot high buildings directly on the opposite side of Martin Acres. To put this in context, all of Martin Acres is roughly 1,300 housing units. So in this proposal with 610 housing units, it's roughly half of Martin Acres neighborhood population wise, going onto a road that already operates at a crawl at many points of the day. Staff, you comment in your packet on page 177, quote, further, the, con the current proposal does little to achieve a transition in scale to surrounding uses and neighborhoods with the majority of the building frontages going five stories. Uh, yep. That's a problem. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lisa. 
Next up, we have Cecilia Gears, followed by Lynn Siegel. Please go ahead, Cecilia. You have two minutes. My, my name is Cecilia Gers. I'm a um, resident at the southeast end of uh, Martin Acres, uh, two blocks from Table Mesa. I shop once a week in the uh, shopping in the uh, 50, 2952 baseline location. Sprouts is the place where I get most of my groceries. I like eating at Moe's. I am very happy that there is a uh, zone where I can do retail shopping in my neighborhood. My concerns about this proposal are the increase of traffic that it will bring, uh, the potential loss of retail. Um, I'm very concerned about the big emphasis on student housing and the, um, the fact that we really need affordable housing in this city and that's not at all being addressed or if it's being addressed, it was merely a passing mention of um, diverse groups in the residential units. I really recommend that there be no zoning change. I recommend that there be no modification to height. And um, I really recommend that this proposal not go forward without massive um, reorientation from students to afford affordable housing within the city of Boulder. Thank you for hearing my concerns. Thank you, Cecilia. Lynn Siegel, you are up next, followed by Hunter Miller. Please go ahead, Lynn, you have two minutes. Just when I think I'm so smart, boy. Um, you know, I wonder how this even came before this board this way. Um, it's it's so so long that these same problems keep on happening. And how is it that I know the developer needs to make their money and everything, but the community benefits side of this and, and neighborhood centers and the value of the retail and commercial, you know, where's the hardware, hardware store? Where's the pharmacy? I mean, we lost the pharmacy right at where I, where I live by Alpine Balsam. Um, the neighborhood centers need to be emphasized. And this is the perfect opportunity because this is surrounded by high intensity student housing. And look at what we have at Millennium, 950 student bedrooms at the Millennium. The Millennium should have been landmarked like the Dark Horse. And I mean, the Dark Horse should certainly stay too. Um, it's just so remarkable to be in a university town and get educated like at this planning board meeting. It just reminds me of, of everything, all the history of this and what needs to happen and that, that we shouldn't have these long meetings. It should be very clear what you can do. There should be zoning for the hardware store. And that's what you have to have there. And that's what Bill Hollicky has to put in there if he wants to develop it. Save all the time. Thanks for your listening. Thank you, Lynn. Next up, we have Hunter Miller followed by Rosemary Higgerty. Please go ahead, Hunter. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Hunter Miller. I live at Foothills and Table Mesa. Uh, I work at Ball Aerospace as a spacecraft systems engineer. I went to school here at CU starting in 2012. My dad went to CU here as well. He graduated in 1986 and used to go to the Dark Horse all the time. We still meet there on a regular basis. I mean, the Dark Horse spans multiple generations. It's pretty wild. I am all for the points that other people are making with regards to housing, updating old properties, etc. But look around. I mean, we lost the Walrus, Boulder Cafe, Sturts and Copeland, Cosmos, potentially another one. Bova's on the hill. I mean, what's next? I don't know. Like the sink? Dushanbe Tea House? If those places were on hard, hard times, we'd come up with other solutions. Change is inevitable. I get that. But we have to draw the line somewhere. And that line is the world famous Dark Horse. Thanks. 
Thank you, Hunter. Next, we have Rosemary Higarty, followed by Nick Aguilera. Go ahead, uh, Rosemary. Thanks. Hi, thanks for letting me speak tonight. Um, I just agreed with so much of what people were speaking about opposing this plan. I have real big concerns about traffic on baseline. I don't know if any of you have the displeasure of being on baseline already in rush hour traffic. It's a nightmare. It's super scary. And I can't imagine even considering or adding another light on 29th Street, which is just going to increase more pollution from having more cars idling. Um, I'm really, really concerned about the high-end luxury student housing. Sometimes I wonder if, if Boulder of City is has any benefit left for the citizens of Boulder or if it should just be called Planning Board for CU of Boulder, because that seems like that's all we're turned into is a planning board for new CU high-end luxury student housing. Um, I also wondering, is anybody keeping track of how much housing there now is? There's been so many more projects going on and what, what the phase of housing is. I really agree that I wish Boulder would just let go of the payment in lieu program. I think that has been such a huge mistake for this town and that it has really dealt with no affordable housing or very little affordable housing being built because of that. Um, I don't really care about the dark horse. So that's one one thing that, you know, I did find it very ironic when people just kept saying the owner is 70 years old and it's just like, like, oh my God, that's so old. Like, <laughs> like really? Um, I just really, really beg that you guys consider this. I We want a neighborhood center. We don't want another CU student housing center. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, we have two more people waiting to speak. Nick Aguilera, followed by Brent Fontana. Please go ahead, Nick. Hi, Boulder Planning Board. Um, my name is Nick Aguilera. Uh, thank you. I'm writing, or I wanted to speak in support of the redevelopment. Um, Boulder urgently needs more housing and mixed use developments. Um, I've been here for almost three years, um, fall into the lower spectrum of income in Boulder. Um, and I know that we absolutely need to increase our housing supply at large at the same time as we're providing more affordable housing in the city. And this development is part of that. Um, we can't oppose the development of more housing to allow more people to live here in Boulder. Um, I know that this isn't the purpose of the meeting, but I would really love to see like the abolition of parking minimums uh, and the continued strengthening of our bus and transportation network so that it's safe and easy for people to get around without a car. Uh, people don't need to come with cars and people don't need to come with parking. Um, please do everything you can to further reduce the parking at this site or de decouple the cost of parking from housing construction costs or a uh, rental cost rather. I'm so tired of seeing excessive empty parking lots in Boulder and throughout the country. That does nothing to create a uh, character and livability in a neighborhood place. We really need to build our community for people, not for private cars. Um, I'm really happy to see the plans to reduce the number of car injury and exit points around the site to make it safer for people walking and biking. I rely heavily on my bicycle to get around Boulder after an acquired disability. Um, I'm really sad that Sprouts will be closed due to re redevelopment as I live in Table Mesa and regularly shop there. But I'm also happy to hear you all talking about the importance of um, you know, including a new grocery store, including new developments. I think everything, everybody's comment speaks to the need for more housing in Boulder, uh, more affordable housing, and also more affordable business developments. And for that, we need more space at large uh, for people and for businesses and for um, human-centric places. Um, once again, really glad uh, that this is a plan in discussion here in Boulder. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Next, we have Brent Fontana, followed by Dorothy Cohen, and those are the two uh, last speakers we have on the on the list. Um, if others would like to speak, please go ahead and raise your hand. Please go ahead, Brent. Hello, my name is Brent Fontana. I'm a 30-year resident of Boulder and the father of four Boulder natives. Um, we all live in South Boulder. And I think one of the strengths of our community is 
not so much what you sometimes see reflected in planning board discussions, which is strong opposition or strong support for any one plan, but deep rational debates about the viability and use of our neighborhoods. And in South Boulder, what we've repeatedly experienced is developers coming in, identifying BC2 permitted and zoned land and trying to get abatements to develop it in other ways. We would simply like to see those parcels developed as intended for the use of the residents. I don't think anyone's opposed to development. People understand the need for more housing. People understand the need for future development. But there simply doesn't seem to be any attempt by developers to actually develop the sites as zoned. And most of the rational debate within the community around it is centered on that. I think I've heard lots of great points tonight about walkability, about access to multiple different types of transport and travel, about access to use, but I simply don't understand why repeatedly over and over in South Boulder, we saw it at 2700 baseline, now we're seeing it on the other side of the freeway, and every single BC2 zoned piece of property seems to be ripe for dense development and no if little mind is paid towards the actual intent to use and zone of the community surrounding it. So please pay attention to that original zoning. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Brent. Next up, we have uh, Dorothy Cohen, and she's the final um, speaker with, the, with her hand raised. Please go ahead, Dorothy. Two minutes. My name is Dorothy Cohen, and I live in Martin Acres. The Boulder Valley Comp Plan identified at 2952 Baseline as a neighborhood center described it the follow. In addition to serving as neighborhood gathering places, these centers also provide goods and services for the day-to-day -day needs of nearby residents, workers, and students. Neighborhood centers should include a mix of locally serving retail. The anchors such as grocery stores, personal services, hair salons, etc. 2952 is identified as a neighborhood center providing serving residents. I currently shop at Sprouts and my friend who was here and got tired of waiting left. She also um, shops at Sprouts. The students use it. I know Corelli's is a neighborhood gathering place and I don't know how long Corelli's has been there. The dark horse, which is almost a historic marker. I moved here in 74 and that's the year um, that uh, the dark horse started. The city is trying to have more folks drive less for carbon footprint and climate change. By removing sprouts, they illuminate grocery stores within walking distance of the residents. I think the 15 minute rule of a walkable neighborhood needs to be looked at more carefully. The city needs to look at zoning and keep businesses that serve neighborhoods by not getting rid of the barbecue, the pizza, Corelli's and the dark horse and force people to drive more. I do not think we need two boutique student housing within a mile of each other. The city needs to enforce uh, the comp plan. And also I re reiterate what people have said about traffic. Um, I often stop at Sprouts on my way home and traffic is pretty bad there. And it's gonna be worse if they have another stoplight there. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, we have, um, I believe it's Macon Coles. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Good evening, Planning Board. My name is Macon Coles, and I live at 17th and Mapleton. What we've got here is a struggling neighborhood center. We all cherish our neighborhood centers. There are eight of them in Boulder. And the reason we do is because they're good examples of being the center, the commercial center, of 15 minute neighborhoods that serve the needs of residents that are nearby and people can walk and bike to those commercial centers to serve the um, eat at the restaurants and patronize the grocery stores. What we've got here is a struggling neighborhood center badly in need of renovation. I it's a, it's a little bit stunning for me to see so many people speaking forcefully about preserving the parking lot. Um, which is what this most of this site, this 10 acre site is about. But what this development promises to do is actually strengthen the neighborhood center by adding somewhat about 10% to the commercial space that is there and then adding to this already a 15 minute neighborhood, adding 610 units. 
The walk score is very high for this area and the bike score is too. And yet traversing this site, walking through it is just such a problematic thing. Folks, if you look at retail around our town, everywhere it is struggling. And we, we need to do things that will strengthen neighborhood centers like this. And I think the, the plan that is proposed here to provide more housing for people like Dave, who works at Whole Foods and was driven from our town by the inability to find any housing, we need to seize this opportunity, add that housing and strengthen this center. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Are we done? Yep, no other hands. All right, awesome. Thank you all very much. And uh, we appreciate all the input. Uh, if you guys are okay, I'm not gonna take a break. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, um, all right. So, cause we have um, Chandler who's sick and George and ML who are sick. So trying to get this so they can get to bed at a reasonable hour. Um, all right, so staff has suggested that we have four uh, key questions. I'm wondering um, if at least briefly we can put those questions up on the screen and then we'll take them down again as we go through each one. Um, Everything. Let me okay. pull it up for you. Just put up, I think just put up, I think you did one at a time, right, Chandler? So just put up the first one and we'll go through that. Yep. Thank you. While he's doing that, I think what we'll do is we'll go through each question. I'll just go down the line. Um, and then if people have comments, they want to respond to something anyone on the panel said, we can respond. Uh, but just as a reminder, as a concept review, this is our opportunity to give feedback, to raise concerns, to talk about what we think is awesome or less than awesome. Um, and uh, when it comes back, down the road for site review, there'll be the opportunity to uh, to explore some of the questions, some of the issues in a, a more deeply. Okay, key issue number one, is the proposed concept plan generally compatible with the goals, objectives, and recommendations of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan? All right, um, Chandler, if you take that down. Oh, considerations, uh, uh, neighborhood centers, economic, social, cultural opportunities, pedestrian friendly and welcoming environments, and mixed use places that strive to accomplish the guiding principles of neighborhood centers. Um, all right, Chandler, if you take that down and then we can, I don't mean to be just rushing, but we, it, it, we have been here for a while. Um, okay. Figure out how to take it down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll, uh, folks online, I will come to you last. I'm just gonna go down the line here already. Mark. Okay, so I'm gonna make some more general comments, but I guess they align with the key question number one. An answer to does uh, the project align with BVCP goals for neighborhood centers? <clears throat> I think that the answer is certainly yes. However, um, I find uh, the, George, was that? <laughs> <laughs> Not my turn to comment. Not my turn to comment. <laughs> yeah. um, the, uh, what, what I struggle with is what I struggle with at many concept reviews, and that is the, in this case, uh, the applicant has come to us and expressed a great desire to uh, receive our input and to potentially modify uh, the concept based on our input. But they've come with a plan that's thin enough, so thin that um, it plays into a lot of community fears and it, um, uh, it's hard sometimes to actually comment on it because of the thinness and lack of design to respond to. So um, 
in terms of neighborhood centers on the application on page 209, the applicant says they propose and want to build a vibrant, fully functioning neighborhood. And I, I, I love that. I am support of rehabilitating acres of asphalt and soulless parking into um, a vibrant neighborhood center. But um, I think that the tension there with, a, with this application is such that uh, it, it doesn't feel like what's put before us is will realize that particular uh, aspiration. And this is a, an application that as I read through staff's comments, it is the, I am most aligned with staff's comments of any application or concept review that's come before us. So in terms of neighborhood centers and what uh, this could be, I think, uh, take a close look at, I'm sure you have, but I continue to uh, support staff's comments about the size massing and uh, overall design and access. So neighborhood center, yes, but uh, this is a this is a tough one. And the, again, the concept review seems thin and playing to some some fears that the community has. Great, thanks, Lisa. Oh, Lisa, Laura. <laughs> I, I take that as a compliment. You sorry, it, Lisa. sorry. <laughs> it is late. It is late. Uh, I'll try to be brief. I think generally, yes, this is compatible with the goals and objectives of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. I do have the same concern that has been mentioned about the purpose of a neighborhood center being to support the community with retail and neighborhood serving uses and services. So I appreciate the applicant asking us, do we prefer to have more retail on the ground floor? For me, the answer is clearly yes. I understand that that poses some challenges with the economics because retail does tend to struggle. And this is something we're trying to balance that people want 15 minute neighborhoods. They want walkability. They want the restaurants and the shops and the gas stations and the things that they need uh, close to home. And we don't have the density often to support those things. And so I very much appreciate that this concept tries to do both. It tries to be a win-win and give us some housing as well as neighborhood serving uh, uses on the ground floor. And then those people who live above can help be customers for those businesses. So generally, I think this is a great concept and yes to more retail on the ground floor. Kurt. You guys are so quick, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> uh, so there are multiple layers of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan, right? There's the goals and objectives, the policies, uh, there's the, the land use designations, and then there's the neighborhood centers. And unfortunately, not all of these are always uh, pulling in the same direction. They're sometimes in conflict, and I feel like they are in this particular case. <clears throat> I think that there are a lot of the policies uh, of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan that this is completely aligned with in terms of providing greater uh, additional housing, um, reducing impervious space, um, impervious surface, um, uh, uh, improving economic vitality. The, the applicant team listed a bunch of these in the application. And I think I agree with, with many, if not all of those. Uh, in terms of the land use, so it's split between CB and NUB. CB is listed as being primarily business, which in the, if you look at the part of this plan that is, has the CB land use, that little Western corner, that is not business. Um, it's not, it's, it's completely residential. So there's, there's that. Uh, on the other hand, MUB talks about a significant amount of housing. And so I think, and that's what is being proposed. And I think that that is consistent. Uh, in terms of the neighborhood centers, I agree with what um, what Laura and Mark talked about that uh, they they do need to be neighborhood serving. They need to provide a significant amount of, or I guess, yeah, I, I would say a significant amount of of commercial neighborhood serving commercial. 
so I think it's very important that we not lose any commercial, any commercial space, uh, that we provide at least as much as we currently have, and preferably more, as Laura pointed out, the economics are difficult these days. People keep, you know, ordering off of Amazon, <laughs> and we all do, and that hurts our, our neighborhood stores. And so that's the reality that we're in. As Laura said, we want to have the, the local commercial, but we don't always have the land use structure uh, and the behaviors in order to support it. So, um, so overall, I would feel, I feel that it does support, um, it, it, it is in alignment with the Boulder Valley Comp Plan, uh, providing as much commercial as is feasible and, um, and perhaps without the hotel, uh, which is not really a neighborhood serving use. Okay, I'm gonna to go to ML and then George and then me. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so key issue number one, the, the BVCP is our guiding document. And as such, as such, this identifies the neighborhood center with plenty of direction for accomplishing this. As proposed, this project does not meet the intent nor guidance for a neighborhood center. Staff has done a really great job of pointing out the deficiencies, so I won't go into them. Furthermore, the land use of MUB has not been rezoned and the existing zoning of BC2 zoning uh, establishes this as predominant retail as well. So I, if we look at the BVCP as the um, sort of guiding, uh, guiding document, and the zoning is a supporting document. I think both of these point to uh, this having a stronger commercial and retail base than is being proposed with this project. Um, so I think that it needs to be, the applicant should take a closer look at what the BVCP and the BC2 zoning um, are asking for. Thank you, ML. Uh, George? Wow, um, ML um, was very eloquent in what she said, and I second that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start my comments, try to try to keep them relatively brief at a, at a, at a more of a 30,000 foot level, um, which is, um, while I respect the applicant and what they're proposing here, uh, to me, coming in with this application, maxing out every level of density on the site um, is a strategy, and, and I think Chandler said it best, a seven pound, a 10 pound, a five pound bag. And, um, you know, it forces us to comment on something that is so outrageously outsized that we whittle down to the six pounds in the five pound bag instead of starting where we should, which is with BC2, um, and how this site is zoned and how it should interact with the community. So um, I also want to, um, uh, we haven't had the opportunity to thank uh, the public for coming out um, and uh, heard the public loud and clear as it relates to how many people uh, value what's there today. Um, understand that change is inevitable, um, but want something that respects where Boulder was and where it's going and um, doesn't destroy their community along the way. Um, of the people we heard, only a handful uh, were for the project of which um, two actually worked for the developer uh, in public comment. So uh, just, just some things to, to reflect on. Um, I agree with ML that um, I, I don't believe this uh, um, uh, works with the BBC plan as as BC, as BC2 has stated. Um, I, I'm not opposed to housing here. Uh, I'm not opposed to redevelopment here, um, but I think it needs to be predominantly neighborhood serving commercial. I do not agree that retail is not profitable. It's just the fact that what's been proposed is the wet dream of profitability for the owners and developers of this site. And we need to step back as the planning board and look at it from a community holistic perspective and look at what it was intended for 
uh, and try to honor that use in the neighborhoods that exist there. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I'll come to you. Um, so I'm going to agree with um, everything ML said and almost everything George said. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with the wet dream thing, but um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I think uh, first Chandler did an amazing job of highlighting the uh, the very specific uh, BVCP and code challenges of what has been proposed. I think his framing it as, I think he said seven pounds in a five pound bag is exactly the problem. It's just, it's like on steroids. Uh, and um, <clears throat> the, I think the, what I'd like to, I won't be here, but when you come back with your uh, actual site plan, I would suggest that it be a smaller development with uh, more uh, retail, uh, neighborhood serving retail, uh, and that um, maybe one way to deal with the economic challenges of retail is to propose smaller plates um, so that instead of 7,000 square foot uh, spaces, you have 1,500 square foot spaces and you can have a lot of smaller uh, neighborhood serving retail options that way. Um, I'm, uh, I also, um, so the BVCP uh, is pretty clear that about these transition zones um, and uh, that are near existing neighborhoods and encouraging low and medium density residential uses, such as single family housing, row homes, and a variety of flats. You've only proposed flats. And I, um, I sure there are reasons for that, but I'd like you to try to think about some additional housing types, uh, especially if you're moving into the transition zones um, and the other, I want to reiterate something that um, uh, one of the members of the community said, uh, Lisa, whose name last name I can't remember, she pointed out that um, the BC zone density is supposed to be lower density than the downtown density, and yet that's not what you've proposed. Um, so uh, take it off steroids, add some more commercial space, uh, look to see if you can add some additional um, uh, housing, different housing types. And I will, of course, eventually talk about needing more green space and even some free range trees. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to add one, one other sentence to my comments, uh, touching on something that Kurt mentioned, I think, uh, and that is the hotel, which the applicant asked, also asked about, that you're proposing a hotel, if that is something that planning board and city council would support. And I would say, based on Chandler's analysis, a hotel here would be extremely difficult to achieve. Uh, and I don't know that it is something that we're particularly trying to make happen in this particular neighborhood. It's not a neighborhood serving use. So I would not uh, go out of my way to put a hotel on this site. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, next is a, a key question number two, which I'll just read, which is, the, does the board have feedback on the conceptual site plan and building design? And this time I'll work backwards. Uh, George, let's start with you. Sorry, can you can you put that up on the screen real quick? Uh, sure. So Chandler, are you still right with us? In. Thank you. Yep. Okay, hold on. Um. I, I think I cover that in, in issue number one. I, I believe that the conceptual design design um, was was put forth as a strategy to maximize the site. And I think the developer needs to go back and look at um, our, our comments and, and really massively revise it um, to more accommodate what, what this should be as far as BC2 goes. I don't have other comments. All right, thanks, George. Um, Chandler, if you can remember how to take that down so we can see ML. Thank you. Um, ML, you're next. Thank you. Um, okay, so again, I believe that the staff has provided good input on the site and building design issues that need addressing, including access, open space, permeability and scale. I will add um, that I, I would not support residential on the ground floor of any buildings facing Baseline or 30th Street. Uh, it's a specific input. 
Um, I would be interested in seeing a range of basic services that can support the neighborhood so that the project does not become a car dependent development. I would also say that any parking reduction, especially for students, have a good option for the car storing reality. Um, lastly, you refer to this as an urban development. I'm not sure this has the density for that, and especially that such a significant amount of tenants will be students. Students are transient and are generally not here in summers and holidays. That's not a stable population for businesses that operate year round. And I think if we look at this site and the base MAR site, um, there's a lot of student population that impacts the way those businesses can function. So given the BVCP and zoning, it would seem to me that your target population might better be focused on working folks and not on students. I think that would help bring stability to the businesses and create um, a base for a neighborhood, a neighborhood center. Um, regarding the whole plan, like I say, take a look at what the staff has to say. I think they did a great job. Um, and there is a, a lot of wiggle room provided. So um, I, I would consider who, who you will be housing and how they can contribute to the um, neighborhood center intent of the zoning. Okay, thanks, ML. Uh, Kurt? Thanks. I have a number of specific comments. Uh, first of all, I want to call out something that Sarah mentioned, which is about trying to uh, you make use of smaller units for the commercial, which I think is a great idea. I always like to see more smaller spaces rather than fewer larger spaces. Uh, we talked a little bit about the street sections. I think to the narrower and more pedestrian friendly streets that you can make, the better. I think that there are some great examples in Boulder Junction, uh, the north, north section, the Spark area. I think those are fabulous streets. Uh, Mark already mentioned those. And so I think that that, that should be the goal. Um, minimizing the curb cuts and access, I think the staff talked about. Certainly uh, there is a, a, an access off of the parking lot on the, along Broadway, uh, along Baseline, the little small parking lot that you have there that seems unnecessary. It seems like that access could just come off of that street A. Um, and there's also, it looks like there was a parking, an underground parking access to a big building, building A, off of 30th Street. And it seems like that should come off of a lower street, basically also Street A, um, to minimize the number of, of curb cuts on Baseline and, and on 30th. Um, in terms of the height, I'll talk about the, the next question is about the 55 foot height, but in general, I think that kind of echoing what some of the other people have said, there does need to be more variation in the height and the intensity. I think, you know, it's, it's pretty much a consistent four and five stories across the whole, the whole um, development and a, a little more variation or for interest and um, just to um, to provide to to make it less of a a solid wall, I think would be appropriate. It would come at the cost of housing units, and I'm always one to be in support of more housing. Um, but I think that it's um, it's pretty clear that if we want to have a successful and beautiful development we need to have a little more articulation in the height. Um, I will disagree with ML about the, the type of housing. I think that this is an ideal place for student housing. It is just a, across two streets from CU. And so providing student, at least a significant amount of student housing there, I think is, is completely appropriate. <laughs> I did like what ML said about having commercial on uh, along baseline. I think that that is appropriate. I don't know that 
the uh, on the on the the ground floor. I don't know that it needs to be all commercial all the way along 30th because on the other side, certainly on the Willville side, there's no commercial along the street. Uh, but along along baseline, I think that that would be great. Um, and I think that that is it. Thanks, Laura. Site design is not my forte, so um, I'm not going to say much here other than to say I think staff made some great comments, and I didn't see anything in there that I disagreed with, um, except when we'll get to the height at the next question, the question of height and transitions, I'll have something to say. Um, and uh, I do also generally agree that this is a great location for student housing as well as non-student housing. I like that you included a mix in there to provide what ML is asking for, which is you know a, a stable population for the long term. Any housing you put here is more customers for the businesses, right? Whether it's part of the year or all the year. But I think it's great to have that mix. Um, and being so close to CU is is super important. So, and I will second uh, the co the comments of my colleagues uh, as well as staff. Mark. So, you know, we're we're being asked to comment on uh, five, four or five brown blocks that are four or five stories tall. And, you know, it's really hard to comment on the design of that other than to say, yeah, it needs more articulation. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it, and, and, and it does, it feels it, it, you know, even to a guy that loves housing and loves density and likes urban, uh, an urban feel, it feels, you know, it feels massive. Um, and I think, again, uh, when confronted with this thinness of design, it's hard, it's hard to say anything other than, uh, gee, it, 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 I understand the community's concerns and fears about the scale of the development. And I, I'll just make a general comment on some design things that feel like are going on in Boulder, and that is buildings without tops, that you go up four or five floors, and it kind of disappears into a thin line. And the building doesn't have a cap. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a cake that has a top and a bottom. It, it goes up and it just ends. So I, I would urge you to, uh, in your designs, to make the building have a top and a bottom and a middle and have it feel like something. I, I think that the other thing that I see is gratuitous material changes. You have no materials. You, you have the Pinterest board of possible things. Not many of those images look like housing. To, they look more like commercial office buildings and less like housing than what I would uh, hope and, and, and hope that the community feels like, which leads into um, my comments about the site design and open space. Uh, a lot of that open space is linear associated with the path next to Highway 36. And, and the community has talked about noise levels from 36. And, and really that is not a space. Uh, I think it's great to have trees along the path. I think there needs to be more connection from the path into the site. Because if you, what's shown, I counted one or two connections into the site from the path. Um, and they kind of fritter away. And again, this is concept review, I understand, but it doesn't feel like a great connection from the path into the site. Uh, and counting that as open space is fine, but when you have roof open space, linear open space next to the street, and it seems like a minimization of community open space within the site, that if I come down out of my building and I'm I'm in the courtyard, or I want to greet my friends or have a lunch outside or whatever, it doesn't feel like there's enough of that. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, then the final uh, thing is, you know, I'll, I'll, I don't want to denigrate the dark horse or sprouts or anything else, but it, it is a terrible sea of asphalt. And, and what you're proposing is an improvement, but that doesn't um, relieve you of the responsibility of design excellence and, uh, and making that place uh, feel like home for the people that 
are living there. I'm all for residential uses there, both student and uh, uh, non-student folk. Um, but I, I really want it to feel like someplace that uh, is identifiable as home versus uh, storage for, for people. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so I'll bounce off of Mark's comments about uh, green space, uh, really totally inadequate in the in the design that you've offered. Um, I think he's he's he talked about it uh, with great um, effect. Um, I agree with almost everything I've heard from uh, my colleagues. Um, one thing we heard from uh, neighbors was uh, the concern about having tall buildings along 36 that would bounce sound over into um, Martin Acres. And I, um, I'm not a sound engineer, uh, but I think that that's something for um, applicants and staff to be concerned about. Uh, and I wouldn't want to stay in a hotel or live in an apartment building that was right up against 36 if I didn't have to. And so I'm wondering if it's worth thinking about moving, um, this would of course, throw out everything you have right now, but to think about moving your parking garage to be against 36 and having some sort of uh, uh, covering uh, that would hide the parking garage from 36, much the way we uh, uh, approve that for the new buildings at Ball Aerospace. And then, um, so you're, instead of putting people against 36, you're putting cars against 36. And um, it could also be low or maybe not bounce off so much sound to Martin Acres. And then you'd have a different configuration uh, opportunity in the space that's left. And, that may not that may not make any sense. Um, I'm not an architect, but I'm just trying to think about ways to um, open up space, make how the housing of the residential that you're thinking of building along there something that's more appealing to people. To in a, that you're 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 not having people live up against the freeway. Um, and I'll just reiterate what Mark said. It's really hard to comment on Lego buildings, which is what you're asking us to comment on. Um, and uh, I understand that you don't want to go too far down the road before coming in, coming to staff for concept review and input and coming to us for concept review and input. But we almost don't know what we're responding to. And that's really, really challenging. So those are my comments. Um, all right, we'll go to... Can I just yeah, yeah. follow up? I, I thought that Sarah's suggestion of moving the, the parking to along 36, if it's possible, which may not, be. but if it, if it were, I think it'd be great. I think that's a fantastic idea. And ordinarily we say, oh, well, you can't have an exposed parking garage, right? It's gotta be wrapped. Well, if it's on 36, the side on 36 does not have to be wrapped with anything, right? So whether it would work or not, I don't know, but I just wanna raise Oh, thanks. And no, one I, other thing is, as I'm looking at ML, uh, in terms of concept site plan and building design, this is not human scaled, which I know is one of um, ML's um, concerns about development in town. This isn't human scaled, at least not as it's proposed at 55, mostly 55 feet across the way with very great density, small amounts of open space. Um, so uh, please put please do what you can to put uh, humans back into the overall design. Okay, um, question number three is um, broadly, is the proposed height of 55 feet in general proportion to the height of existing buildings and the proposed or projected heights of approved buildings in the area? And I'm wondering, um, Chandler, if you can actually bring up, you had had su four sub questions. Do you remember that in the, in the, in the, oh. uh, you know, the ones I'm talking about? Yep. Hold on one sec there after all these pictures. Oh, wait, there we go. <laughs> okay. Um, I think under, if I read the proposal correctly, under height, you had four sort of sub questions. I think this was them. Are these them? Okay, yeah, yes. These, these are them. They just look, they're really long on a slide. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, 
uh, does the board find that the building heights are compatible with the character of the area? Are the board buildings form, massing, and length designed to a human scale? If the board finds the building height is not comp <coughs> compatible with the height of buildings in the surrounding area, is the project near enough to an area of redevelopment where higher intensity of use and similar building height is anticipated to justify the increased building height? Does the project preserve and take advantage of prominent mountain views from public spaces? And if there are prominent mountain views from the site, usable open spaces on the site or elevated common areas of the building are located and designed to allow users of the site access to such views. So those are sort of the boundary, not boundaries, but uh, uh, a framework for us to, to, to tackle yeah. this particular question. And th those are taken from the site review criteria, just as an aside. Okay, great. That's very helpful. Thank Sarah, you. Before, before we have the discussion, can I ask a question? Sure. So Chandler, I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't, uh, or maybe Charles knows the answer to this. I'm sorry I didn't cue this up ahead of time, but when we were doing the new site review criteria, and I assume this project is coming in under the new site review criteria. Correct. We talked about where would height modifications be appropriate, and we did not, as I recall, include a specific distance to another building of similar height. Where did we land on that? What does it say in the new site review criteria? There isn't a requirement that has a distance requirement or any kind of saturation requirement for height modifications. They're considered individually. They're considered individually. And what is our what are our goalposts or what are our guidelines that say when it's appropriate? These criteria are right here. These here, mm -hmm. okay. Which are, again, um, extracted from the site review criteria. Right, so we don't actually, we don't have to determine these now, but they're a good framing for our thinking. Yeah, okay. that, that was our hope. Okay, great. Um, if you don't mind Chandler taking those down so we can see our colleagues, thank you. Um, I'll start with Mark this time and we'll work our way over. Okay, um, I'm not, the site layout as, as far as it goes, doesn't seem to take advantage of any view corridors as, as far as I, I can tell. And it answers the same question in terms of uh, building height. I'm not afraid of 55 feet. I, I don't think the community should be a bit afraid of 55 feet. We have a 55 foot height limit. It's not 35 feet, it's 55 feet with the right community benefit. But given what we've been presented, which of these the blocky Lego like buildings in the current layout, I, I see a I see I don't see any um, design taking advantage of views, and that speaks to goes back to the open spaces that ideally you would have building layouts that create meaningful open spaces that also incorporate views. So that's what I have to say about this question. Okay, thank you, Laura, or Lisa. <laughs> Either one, it starts with an L, it's good for me. You can call me Leonardo, I don't care. Um, so uh, I also am not afraid of 55 feet. I think it's important for the community to understand the height limit that we refer to as the height limit in BC2 is the by right height limit. That means that the developer can build that without going through any special process, without asking for any special permission, without meeting any extra criteria, they can just do it. Um, but in this zone, it is appropriate to go up to 55 feet if they go through the site review process and we determine by our criteria that that is appropriate for that site. So they're not breaking any rules, they're not getting any special exemption, they're going through the process that, that the city has determined is the appropriate process to get up to 55 feet, which is allowed at this site. So I just wanna make sure people understand that because most people don't, I didn't two years ago. Um, so 55 feet, I think is appropriate. This is a site that is surrounded by really tall buildings that are part of the CU campus that do not have to obey the height limit because they're part of CU. So they don't have to obey the 55 feet. That's why you have those super tall buildings uh, in Willville one. Um, so that's on one side of the project. The other, the boundary to the West is an elevated highway. So I'm not really worried about compatibility with that. And also to the, to the what is that? If you head towards Mexicali, what direction is that? North, north. to the west. north. I think that's north. That's, no, it's north. It's heading okay. north. Heading north. Again, you're. This is an off ramp from 36. North so west. It's not that it's. <laughs> it's not 
Typical neighborhood centers are actually adjacent to single family residential. And then we're concerned about transitioning down to that. This whole site is bounded either by an elevated highway, an off ramp from an elevated highway, a major arterial five lane road that has a turning lane in the center that separates it from commercial right across the street. And then there's residential that's kind of catty quarter, but not actually adjacent in any way. Um, yeah, and that's basically the whole site. Like it's not adjacent to anything that, that for me would prevent it from going up high. I do agree with what staff said in the packet, which is that um, it doesn't abide by some of our criteria in terms of the length of building frontages and variation of roof lines. As Kurt pointed out, it needs more variability. But in general, I'm not afraid of 55 feet on this site. I'm not especially concerned about the transition zones over on uh, adjacent to baseline, again, because that's a five lane highway, <laughs> not a highway, but a five lane arterial road. Um, so, so yeah, I think with some sensitive design and, and make this actually something that people think is attractive and that they feel is a nice place to be, I, I'm not concerned about the height or the transition zones, frankly. Kurt. I agree with a lot of that. I think certainly a maximum height of 55 feet is appropriate here, given the proximity to Willville and Bear Creek Apartments. And we haven't mentioned uh, the new North Hall and whatever the one is there on the east side of Willville, which are six or seven stories at least. Uh, across baseline, there was mention that, oh, well, there's one to three story buildings there, but that's BT1 zone. And that is almost certainly going to change. It's certainly not a residential neighborhood uh, directly across baseline. So that I don't think should be of a, of a concern to the Northeast uh, is residential, but the even if this were built right to the corner at 55 feet, the dominant presence from that neighborhood to the Northeast would be Williams Village One. Um, that, that would be what you would see when you looked up in the sky. And so, and also right on the corner, even that is not actually single family, it's RM2. So uh, I'm not concerned about that. As I mentioned before, I do think that there needs to be height articulation just to provide greater interest and um, some just to, to, to make for better architecture, frankly. Uh, ML. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take a holistic approach here. Um, I don't think height is a separate item from the entirety of the project. And if we were getting what the BVCP and zoning set up, I would certainly consider a height modification beyond the one to three story context to support this. I am not afraid of uh, 55 foot high buildings either. Um, but I think that as this project stands, the project is not meeting the basic intent of a neighborhood center. Um, so I wouldn't see a reason to support an added height. We're not getting what we need and what we want, what our zoning is set up for. Um, so to me, that's a, that's a, a broader look at height. I think if we're getting what we want, if we if our if we believe our comp plan and our zoning um, were correct in identifying what should be where in the city, uh, and this was doing that, uh, by all means, I I think this is a great place to have 55 foot height. But I am I don't think it's supporting the basic intent um, that our planning um, tools have identified for this site. Uh, thank you, uh, George. Yeah, I, I think um, ML said kind of exactly what I was thinking in a, a much more eloquent way than I could um, say it. I also agreed with Mark and and sort of just the general massing and stair stepping and, and a number of my colleagues. Um, the one area I, I um, I disagree with is um, and I'd like to point out is that we don't control CU's zoning. Um, and I don't think that it should necessarily be taken in as the city of Boulder and what we choose to do with our zoning, we should be taking in CU buildings as context 
to the backdrop of our city because we have no control over what they do as far as what they do with their buildings. And by allowing this site to go up to 55 feet, we create yet another tent pole in the city to maximize that 55 feet because now we have a context in the city that in this area that people will leverage down the road. And so I think we need to be cognizant of that um, as it relates to, um, if we look at the context of just the city of Boulder outside of CU that exists there, it's all one to three story buildings. Um, the developer also hasn't provided any elevations, um, any sight lines. Uh, we're looking at flat plans um, angled towards uh, 12 story buildings um, conveniently. And so it's very difficult, I think, for me to judge whether or not 55 feet is appropriate and where on the site. Uh, my gut is it probably is under the right circumstances um, in select areas. But I, I think, um, uh, as ML, ML put it best, that I, I um, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks. And I will um, uh, throw my hat in with ML and George. In fact, I had written here, I don't sit, think city code based development should, you, should use non city code compliant developments to justify height, height modifications. So we were on the same page on that. That being said, I agree with Kurt that uh, there, uh, it's been said before, we need different articulation at, of heights in this area. I think the transition requirements for transition or the suggestions for transitions towards the lower uh, lower density neighborhoods might be the right place to do it. Um, and one thing I just wanna, I wanna swing back for a moment to the conceptual site plan. Um, the, the length of these buildings, some of these buildings are quite big and that building that's the wraps around the proposed parking garage feels like a fortress. Um, or it looks like a fortress. I don't know whether it would feel like one. There's no permeability there. And um, so I just wanted to bring that back up. I had written it in the wrong box. Okay, can I, can I, yes, please. Sorry, just one enhancement. I just wanna say, you know, I think that we rejected the tent pole idea, as Charles said, we didn't, we didn't say that if you're within X number of feet of a tall building, you get to be tall. There's no rule like that. So for me, it's not so much about is this, going to be a new tent pole or is it near a tent pole? It's more about, is this site appropriate for higher uh, intensity and height? And you know, where in the city would we build taller? Where would we do 55 feet if we were trying to plan that? And right along major arterials, baseline is the major east-west arterial in South Boulder. We use it all the time. As people said, that's why it's so busy right? It's right by an elevated highway. It's got a major grocery store in it. Like this is, it, as Macon Cole said, it's hugely walkable. It's hugely bikeable. We have just invested an awful lot in infrastructure, in underpasses, in pedestrian crosses, crossings, in bike enhancements in this area. This is the place where you want intensity. This is the place where you want height, regardless of how tall the buildings next door are. And also it's location quite close to campus. And it is actually pretty close to the bus line to get to downtown if you get onto Broadway. So for me, regardless of what else is around it, for me, it's more about like, do I need to be sensitive to something that's uh, a single family neighborhood that's right adjacent? Um, and, and as we discussed, it's kind of ringed by arterials and highways and stuff like that. Um, so that's, I'll wrap there. Go ahead, just, George. Just one comment on tent poles. I mean, half the board used the justification of the, the buildings next door to it being 120 feet. And so you can call it whatever you want, but the fact of the matter is when these things come up in planning board, the first thing someone references is the 55 foot building down the street from that building as context. And context is, I believe context is in the code as it relates to what we have to evaluate. And what I meant by temple is exactly that. Contextually, Boulder, outside of CU is one to three stories. So call it a temple, call it context, but I, I don't think that that's rejected from, from what's in what's written in the code. I think context is in there. All right, uh, we will go to the last uh, question, which is other key issues uh, that are identified by the board. Um, uh, so I'll start over here. George, I'm gonna start with you. Want to throw up the questions for us? Yeah. Chandla. 
Um, there is, there are no questions. It's, 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 it's uh, the other key issues. Anything you guys want to talk about or identify. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think I've said enough. Thank you. Okay. ML. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Chandler, for putting this question up there. I have three um, other issues that I would like to put on the table. Um, one has already been spoken about, but I'll reiterate it because it didn't come up in our key questions. And that is the project is subject to historic preservation review. This could result in landmark designation eligibility. Um, and I think that this needs to happen prior to the use and site review. And I don't know, um, you know, where that should or shouldn't land, but um, I don't think that the project should should um, come back for use or site review with the potential for uh, a piece of the site to be landmarked and um, taken into another purview. So anyway, point number one. Number two, um, the applicant has talked about the project needing to be phased. And I think we have, um, they're talking about a two year process of deconstruction and construction. And I would just point out that the phasing should include keeping vital services operable during the, the construction time. So we don't have this massive um, vacancy, lack of service or declining service and kind of lose a vital connection for the community to have it, uh, its service needs met. So I think phasing needs to be very carefully thought through and how things might continue to function um, as a service center during uh, the construction project process. And lastly, um, you know, this project highlights the deep issues that come out of updating longstanding sites. We have a crisis with affordable housing and a lack of affordable commerce. If the Williams family truly intend to make a difference with developing the site, I suggest a deep rethink on how to provide what our city needs on this site. Thank you. Thanks, ML. Kurt. I think ML brought up two of the important or the the hot button, I guess, issues. Uh, one relating to the dark horse. You're well aware that this is a, a contentious issue. Um, I, based on my understanding of the, the historic preservation code, the dark horse would not be uh, eligible for, for landmarking. The, there are criteria in terms of historic, uh, significance, architectural significance, and environmental significance. And I don't think that it meets any of those three. There's also, there's preserving the building, but that's different from preserving the actual business, right? I think what people absolutely love uh, and, and cherish and treasure is the combination of that building that so many of us have seen so much of and, and really love and the business in it. And we can pres preserve the building, but we can't preserve the interior, we can't preserve the business um, through landmarking. That said, I think that it might be a wise decision for the applicant to try to come up with a design that keeps the dark horse building where it is and as it is and works around it I think that that might um, might smooth the way for future approvals um, at, at both at planning board and at council when this comes up. So, you know, how possible that is, I don't know. Um, but I think it's it, that's sort of a political decision, uh, but it's something to think about. I think um, ML also raised the, the question of the phasing. Obviously, as an applicant, you want to minimize the amount of time that businesses are out of, are now operating, right? And you're not getting revenue. But I think uh, it'll be key to try to especially keep 
the 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 sprouts um, closed as short a uh, time as possible to minimize the amount of time uh, before it can reopen because that's a crucial neighborhood amenity uh, and contributes to the walkability. The last additional point I have is about that parking space on baseline, which has continued to, to bother me, the, the parking area just on the north side, which again is motivated by flood considerations, I think. Um, but we, we try very hard to avoid having parking in front of buildings on streets. And I, I don't know if there are alternatives that you can come up with. I mean, certainly one would be if it were just a permanent um, uh, food, food cart, food truck pod, I think that that would be fantastic. That would be very feel very different from just a general parking lot. Uh, I realize that it would benefit the, the sprouts or whatever um, whatever grocery store goes in there if it were just a regular parking lot, but um, but to the extent that we can make that a a lively place, a community place, a hopefully a greener place than just a parking lot, I think that that would be great. Laura. Thank you. Um, I do want to address a couple of things that the community brought up and I recognize that most people have had to leave because it's very late and people have things to do, but maybe some folks will watch this uh, on, when they have time. Um, and for the folks who are still here, thank you for still being here, uh, both online and in person. So so the dark horse, I just want to reiterate what, what Kurt said is that even if we did uh, use the Historic Preservation Act to preserve that building, it would just be the exterior of the building that we can preserve. We cannot preserve the interior using that statute. We cannot mandate that the Williams family continue to rent to the current tenant. And we cannot mandate that the current tenant, the person who uh, runs the dark horse, that family, that they continue to do that indefinitely. We, we, can't, we have no control over any of that, right? We cannot tell a private property owner who they have to rent to. And we cannot tell a business you must remain open because the community loves you. People have the right to make choices with their property and with their businesses. So the only thing that we could preserve through historic preservation is the exterior of the building. That's it. Um, and the question of is that, does it have the historic significance? Does it meet the criteria? I, I don't know. That's for the landmarks board to determine. I agree with ML. That's not our purview. And I strongly encourage staff to figure out a way. I know that there's some challenges with sequencing and with landmarking ahead of a development proposal that need to be worked through. And it's much more complex than we have time to talk about tonight. But I strongly feel that that is not planning board's purview to tell an applicant that they need to landmark their property without the landmarks board having determined that they would be willing to landmark over the objection of the property owner. Cause that would be essentially what we're doing if we tell them that they have to apply for landmarking. So for me, that's a very serious, very serious action for the city to take. Um, and I'm very interested to hear from staff how we're going to sequence that and do that so that the Landmarks Board has their proper say and that the applicant gets due process in front of the Landmarks Board if we are in fact considering historic preservation of that building. Um, that said, I know that people love the Dark Horse and I appreciate that the applicant is trying to work with the owner to preserve that use, not just the building, but the use um, and make sure that that, that uh, community amenity continues to be around if possible, right? If possible. So that's my thoughts on the dark horse. And then the other one I wanted to just mention is the affordability aspect, which of course everybody here cares about. You know, we all see that Boulder is becoming less and less affordable over time, that, um, you know, people who have very important jobs, but that don't make huge amounts of money get squeezed out of Boulder. And so we are interested in affordable housing. I just wanna make sure people understand, because again, I didn't understand any of this two years ago, State law requires that the city give developers choices. We cannot mandate you must build affordable housing right here. We simply can't do that. What we can do is through our inclusionary housing program say either you build, and currently it's 25%, either you build 25% of these units affordable on site, or you contribute what's called cash in lieu, or you can give us land of the equivalent value so that we can build it somewhere else. 
Most developers right now choose to do the cash in lieu option. And we, the planning board and the city council have no control over that. The state says we have to give them that option, right? That's the program that we have. So anybody who's concerned about affordable housing, I do encourage you to go to the city's inclusionary housing website. There's a really good uh, website there that will show you where we are building that affordable housing, what we are doing with that developer money. Because I think people think we just give developers a pass and they don't have to build the affordable housing and it never gets built. Well, it is getting built. It's just getting built in different places around the city. And we can actually, as one person mentioned, leverage that money and get federal money and build even more than if we had it on site. So the program is working, even though it's not always very visible. So again, I appreciate that the applicant is willing to do what we require them to do and contribute that to that affordable housing program. So those are my comments. Thank you. Mark. Okay. Um, I, I wanted at the time when we had a whole bunch of people in the room, I wanted to thank them for coming because I could tell that there were a lot of first time speakers here. And that was exciting uh, to me. I, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I knew I was nervous as hell the first time I came and spoke before a board or council or whatever. So it, it was, it was great to see everyone come out and it was, you know, it was understandable to uh, uh, come out about your favorite spot. And Andy, you know, maybe as, as a, uh, I'm an older guy here, been here a long time. I remember Tom's Tavern. I remember the Blue Note. I remember Fred's, Juanita's, Berardi's. I mean, there are, these, are, these are places that were I had meaningful events at. And, and so to the point, we don't have a mechanism, not just planning board, not council. Government doesn't have, really have a mechanism for preserving beloved businesses. So. Uh, as sad as it may seem, I think what, what's being proposed here tonight is to try to reincorporate uh, some version of the dark horse is actually uh, noble because, as you say, you don't have to do that. There, there, is, there is no law, there is no code. So I, I think that that is a, a noble and admirable effort, and I, and I, I feel like a sincere, and I hope you continue to... Um, work towards that. Um, <clears throat> the only other thing I'm gonna say is that I would really welcome, I think the community once, if it's done right, would really welcome a true neighborhood center here. And I think that uh, whether it's four or five stories, whether uh, the an FAR of 1.8 or 1.9, that is not so much the question as can it be designed in such a way that after two years of missing their favorite spots and suffering through stuff, people go, oh, this is actually really great. This, you know, I, yeah, I wanna go shop at the New Sprouts. This is really great. And uh, I, I wanna eat at Corelli's in their new location with their new interior. That sounds great. And, and, and the community, there are lots of things that have been developed and redeveloped that ultimately the community grows to love. And, uh, and I hope this is, this is one of those places, but it, it, um, it will require a, a, a bunch more uh, design work to, I think, uh, from what I've heard tonight, to convince this board that what you've got plans for is, is really will make a, a, a beloved neighborhood center. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, the only thing, I'll, the two things I'll bring up, one is again, those sound issues um, and how you, how you uh, lay out the, what the layout ultimately is and how to reduce sound bouncing into other neighborhoods. Uh, and I think we kind of skipped over the challenge, the parking challenges that you're gonna have, the, the, the more units you have, the more bedrooms you have, the more parking you're gonna require. And while you can push down some make a request for some parking reduction, you're, you're setting yourself up for a, a, a pretty large request. Um, and a, maybe again, bringing it, bringing down the, the scale for a bit would make it, will be helpful. And my final comment is I'm clearly gonna have to go eat at the dark horse. I have, I have never gone to the dark horse. So I am, I am going to have to go to the dark horse. All right, um, that is, 
What? <laughs> right now? <laughs> okay, so that is uh, that completes our public our uh, public hearing. Um, do we normally? Do, do you guys normally have an opportunity to respond? Okay, come on, Ramchand. And before as you get, um, Lisa's going to be joining us for matters, so keep a lookout for her on uh, online. Um, yeah, I'll just say a few things. So um, first of all, I think we've been here a few times and you've hopefully seen that when we ask questions, we mean those as real questions. So um, this was extremely helpful, the feedback that we got. And so I think there's clear direction on a number of topics that's very, very useful. The other thing I would say is that um, I, I totally hear maybe the wish for more information and more design. Um, concept plan has crept up into a higher and higher and higher level of design over the years. Um, but this is a local family and a local business. And there isn't a national development fund to pay for an incredible amount of design at this stage. And the intent was to come with the original, uh, you know, comply with the original tenant concept plan and, and literally ask the questions before a bunch of decisions were made so that you can tell us, hey, you know, you guys are, I'll take it on myself. Hey, Bill, you're wrong. Think about this. And so then it can actually be changed. So. Um, it's really great feedback, really appreciate all that. Um, I, I will point out one thing because of all that we heard about the Dark Horse. I first set foot in Boulder in 1991. The first restaurant I ever went into was a Dark Horse. I've loved it since then. The first meeting that we had with the owner, the question was, we have a problem with the Dark Horse, we need to save it. The family has been subsidizing it for 15 years. The owner is 70, is not gonna be running it for another 15 years. So we gotta figure something out. Um, and that uh, you guys got a letter from both parties saying we got to figure something out, committing to each other to do that. So um, I hope the neighbors can hear that. It's the intent to figure something out here. Um, other than that, uh, thank you. And do you have anything else to add? I first came to Boulder as a climber at 16. And the first place I went to the dark was to the dark horse, but I can't tell you about the rest of the night. Um, but, <laughs> I can't tell you what year that was. <laughs> yeah, that was a long time ago. I'm only 64. Um, but no, I mean, thank you for the input. It's it, concept plan has become, as we've done concept plan and site review, it's become this really kind of awkward dance or, or just difficult dialogue in that you're trying to get enough feedback to go to the next step. And at the same time, you're not getting enough information to always give the right feedback. And so I appreciate the fact that you spent the time, I mean, this is four hours of your life or something, that you spent the time to give us the feedback you could based on what we gave you. Um, I feel like we heard you and I feel like we got a, a lot of good input and we can come back with some really good stuff for site review that I think we'll take that into account and we'll provide the kind of place. I mean, I, my goal is you know, to make this the neighborhood center in Boulder that people say, well, when we define neighborhood center, Go to Williams Village. That's what it is. The, do it like that. And uh, I hope we can live up to that. Great. Thank you. And just lastly, usually we ask questions if anything was unclear, but I've been kind of going through it, taking notes, and I think you all were very clear. So I don't think I have any questions. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. Um, we will now turn to matters. Um, is Lisa online? Okay. Lisa Smith. Hello, hello. Hello. Uh, first, let me make sure that my, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Um, so I let Sarah and a couple staff members know, um, but because it's been really challenging to get consistent um, childcare on Tuesday evenings, I'm going to be stepping down from planning board. Um, so I wanted to say a big thank you to all the planning board members um, and to staff and to everyone who comes before us, whether members of the public or otherwise, it's been a wonderful, what is it, almost four years now, I think, Sarah? Yes. Um, and yeah, but uh, unfortunately, I just wasn't able to kind of consistently be, as you saw, because I have been missing meetings and not able to chair when Sarah's out and so on. And so it's just been kind of a logistical nightmare. So I'm sorry to step down um, and I'll miss all of you. And I wanted to be sure to say it this way before I send a more formal, broader email. Um, and I had really hoped to be there tonight in person, one, to attend the meeting and two, to make this announcement in person, but uh, as a symptom of the overall problem that didn't happen. So um, yeah, that's that's where I'm at. And thanks well, for making the time at the end of a long meeting. Well, Lisa, thank you for uh, letting us know. I'm sure everyone has something they wanna say. Um, I will just say you're managing to get out of uh, being chair just in time. 
I think you timed it that way. All right, I'll let everyone else make a comment. Well, I'll just say you you will be missed, and uh, I've certainly enjoyed serving with you. But you know, the um, I think we all understand whether it's children or elderly parents or whatever it might be. Uh, life has a way of interrupting um, intense hours of volunteer service uh, that extend late into the night. So anyway, uh, uh, everything is understood, and and uh, we wish you the best. I second everything that Mark said. And Lisa, I am so sorry to see you go. It has been a pleasure to serve with you. And you bring a really unique perspective to the board that I don't think any of the rest of us could ever replicate. So it is a loss to see you go. And I'm so sorry, but completely understand and wish you all the best in everything that you have on your plate right now. And uh, you're going to come to the dark horse, right? With, with us. <laughs> Yeah, have not beer. tonight, but but sometime soon. And I wanted to warn Sarah. I didn't know if she'd never been there. Watch out for the bathroom doors, Sarah. Okay, good. Take good a to moment. Know. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. We'll we'll really miss you. And but I think it's admirable that you managed to get through um, four years with this kind of, you know, with a lot of these challenges. So um, so thank you for doing that, and thank you for your service. And um, sorry to see you go, Emma. Gosh, Lisa, I was just getting used to having sharing a board with you again. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Well, I do hope that um, our paths cross again because, um, you know, you have a, a really good perspective on things, and I've always appreciated that. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy your time <laughs> with your little guy. <laughs> George, yeah. Oh, no, I'll, uh, I'll echo the same and just say, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, really sorry to see you go. Um, really, really appreciate your perspective and it will be missed. And um, thank you for your service to Boulder over the past four years. Uh, Lisa, I'm pretty sure Brad and staff might want to say something. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And really on behalf of the department, we... Uh, to uh, Lisa, very much appreciate your uh, service to the community, first of all. Uh, I hope we say often enough to all of you that we recognize that you're doing this uh, as a volunteer effort and that it <laughs> does free. take a fair amount of effort <laughs> and time and, and, and commitment uh, that's really representative of your love for the community. And we know, Lisa, you have that and that you've uh, had that in, in various roles and capacities uh, with the city. And I have no doubt uh, as I think I, I dropped a quick note to you that you will remain very engaged with the community over the years. So I, I suspect we'll continue to see you, but, uh, but thank you for that service. And also uh, just very sorry to see you go for all the reasons that others have said that uh, you have provided uh, a really unique and an important voice. And uh, I'm quite sure we won't be able to replicate that, but uh, uh, we'll do our best. So. And I don't know if Charles. And yeah, thanks so much for your service, Lisa. Um, the last four years, you have definitely uh, affected the outcome of a lot of important projects, and particularly through the COVID era when all this was so challenging. So thank you very much for spending the time that you were able to spend with us and look forward to seeing you in other corners of the community, maybe at the Dark Horse. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a running, running gag. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Anyone else before we let Lisa go to bed? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much, Lisa. I didn't get to work with you very long, but it was uh, very, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, it was really great to work with you and I wish you the best. Um, and I uh, look forward to working with you in different ways in the future. So Laura, I mean, Lisa, <laughs> I, I was called, I called Laura Lisa earlier. Lisa, I'm going to urge you to uh, conclude this meeting for us. And are there matters from staff? Are there, I'm sorry. Are there matters from staff? Uh, nothing for me, Brad. Uh, I was just going to say that we are uh, starting the new year with uh, a plenty to, to bring you. Uh, it'll be a full year, and I appreciate that you've all been managing uh, kind of discussions about the schedule here in the first few months as well, um, uh, understanding the, the desire to move the one item tonight that I think was good foresight, so appreciate that one. I think so. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, and, and accommodations from everybody, but we're going to work hard this year to, to space out the calendar to the best of our ability and to always appreciate and recognize everybody's flexibility. Uh, but in reviewing the work plan uh, for the whole department this year and getting that finalized, uh, it is, it is going to continue to be a full one. So thank you in advance for all your work in that regard. And, you know, it just dawned on me while we're talking about um, Lisa's departure. So council is going to be making appointments on March 21st. So we won't be um, yeah. down a board member for too long. Um, and then I think last day of service for our current outgoing board members is, um, so that's going to be March 31st of this year. So we'll have you through the month of March. Okay. Um, just so you know, I'm, I've already sent dates that I won't be here in March. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll be out of the country. Yeah. Oh. No, you're off. <laughs> just a quick question. So being down a board member, I assume means that doesn't change anything in terms of we still need four votes to be able to pass anything. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that makes attendance a little more complicated, but bring it, we'll do it. <laughs> That's and the attitude. Lisa, was this your last meeting? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Again, so I had hoped to attend in person, but that didn't pan out. So, so we definitely have to take you out for a <laughs> beer or a coffee <laughs> or dinner or whatever. Yeah. All right, Lisa, yeah. adjourn the meeting for us. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for your hard work. Sorry I wasn't part of it this evening. Um, I'm glad I've gotten to serve with all of you for so long and some of you for not as long, but it's been wonderful. And I hereby adjourn this meeting. All right. Woo. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. You missed it. He's doing okay.